and back in our lives. Thank you, chat. Thank you, everybody watching the replay. Future Cannabis Project in the house. Turn it over to the hosts, Brian and Marco. Thank you, guys. Yeah, happy Wednesday to you guys. Uh, it's another episode. Uh, this is uh, really dialed in for the living soil nerds. Uh, I will. I would like to say, you know, as we kick this off, I was talking to Marco a little bit before this. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are continuing to watch this show. I was in Amarillo, Texas, uh, doing my thing with uh, our family business, and a few people were walking up saying hello, and it was really nice. But there was one family in general, so shout out to Laura Camp and her family, uh, just taking the time to really just explain things to to me and the way that she was seeing stuff, and um, you know. Her knowing, her knowing your name, Marco, her knowing uh, Professor Blunt Stash, you know, there was just no way to fake that. And I feel like she was very genuine. So just wanted to kind of give her well wishes and hope that her journey continues because she wants to become a farmer. And this show kind of inspires that. So shout out to her and her lovely family. Uh, I believe I saw like five or six uh, children with her that day. So obviously uh, a lot of time and effort is going to be for her family when she's sitting here watching this stuff. So. Uh, we hope that we continue to impress uh, Laura with your fam with your family and that this is something that I feel like you're going to go back and watch uh, because integrated pest management is really kind of the way that a cannabis farmer earns their stripes uh, as well as kind of earns their paycheck. Yes, uh, when we start to cultivate cannabis, uh, it's fabulous. There's, you know, it, there's such joy when you're really starting to see things, especially with praying leaves, the overall health of the plant. Uh, but there's a variety of ways that we were able to um, protect that plant. And I feel like that's the next level. And uh, Matthew Gates is definitely somebody in our industry that the pros go to that really have tough questions. This is somebody that they're reaching out to. I will say, Matthew, that you're fantastic and always putting out education. You're all over the Internet on a variety of other podcasts. So I hope that you guys continue to reach out. I know on our show on Thursday, we even had you as one of our uh, second or third guests because of just the quality of information that you put out there. Uh, so go check out his YouTube channel, uh, Zenthanol, uh, and then his Instagram is uh, Sync Angel. So, you know, the social media stuff, I feel like is definitely worth a follow and, and checking out because he has a huge playlist, uh, giving away a lot of information on russet mites, uh, especially for you newer farmers out there. Uh, these are probably some of the terminology you might not even know yet that you really need to understand. So a little eight minute video on russet mites so that you're you start to have a trained eye or maybe even uh, a knowledge that those things exist. I feel like spider mites is really the, the nuisance that you start out with and you're afraid of having. But it's really russet mites, hemp russet mites at the end of the day. Uh, if you're trying to be a commercial farmer on where you're going to be able to protect your, your farm. Uh, so, again, Matthew Gates is our guest today, He's somebody that I feel like is. The, the tried and true, the pros pro, who, who are we asking? I know you're about 10, 11 years into this, Matthew, uh, really working hard on that, man. So um, coming to us from San Diego as well. So I was teasing him before we went live here on uh, how cold it is here in Colorado, how warm it is where he's at. Uh, so again, environment matters, especially when you're talking about these kind of things. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, I want to give it over to my co-host here so that he can kind of also talk about uh, the, all of the things that uh, that he's seen with Matthew as well, because the beauty of uh, Matthew's work is it's not necessarily just in the cannabis industry. There's a variety of people all over the world that uh, cultivate in a variety of other uh, subject matter and that kind of thing that are benefiting from Matthew's work. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, once again, like Brian said, thanks to Matthew for even being here. I know he's a very, you're a very busy guy. Um, and uh, to all the family out there, if you guys uh, don't follow him or don't know, uh, Matthew is an entomologist, a mycologist, and a botanist. So this man is like the trifecta. I mean, think about that. All the issues that we go through with our plants, all right, soil, and then and everything else uh, around the plant. Um, Matthew will be a, a, is going to be a great resource. I got a, a lot of questions from um, from the folks out there, Matthew. I got a couple myself, and um, you know how we do. We just kind of flow, so uh, we'll just give you the floor, and, and you take it any direction you want, and we'll just jump in there and, and, and get it going. Sure. I really appreciate you having me. Um, I do want to make a small little air, uh, correction to what you had said. Uh, I'm not actually an entomologist, botanist, mycologist. I just say that I'm that all put together. I don't have a, a, a high degree in I, I, any of these um, subjects, but okay. 
what I do have is a, a degree in horticulture, horticultural science. And I also have spent the majority of my time um, working with folks who work, who are in these fields. And that's why I say that kind of pithy statement on my Instagram, which I assume is where you got that from. So I just wanted to not mislead anyone. I'm very big on that too. Understood. Yeah, I did. I grabbed that off your Instagram, but you know, that's fine. But for you to say that, I mean, listen, school and, and, and getting a piece of paper is one thing and you got that already. Um, but when you start mastering fields, to me, I mean, eventually you just become a master in that field. So um, for what I see, um, paper aside, man, you're, you're a master in all three of those from, from my point of view. So um, let's let's get it going. No, I appreciate that. Um, well, uh, IPM, right? So that's what I'm most known for. And it's something that I think is really critical. And I want to sort of start with a bit of an anecdote. As I say this a lot lately, uh, but it bears repeating. I feel that a lot of people in the cannabis space and also generally in agriculture, um, they kind of, I have noticed that they don't tend to worry about security, like biosecurity of their, of their plants uh, until they've already dealt with some sort of a problem or they've experienced sort of the hassle. Um, they say in physical security and cybersecurity that uh, nobody pays for the security until after they've been robbed, so to speak. And I think there's some truth to that. That's certainly been my experience over over a decade of, um, of a professional work in agriculture. Um, that being said, I am actually very impressed with the cannabis industry because although there are people who also don't give this much credence, there's been a ton of um, outreach and, and folks that I've interacted with that at least got some sort of a, a basis because of kind of like what you were saying earlier, sort of the social media outreach uh, that people are, are striving towards and the connection that we all make together has uh, helped facilitate some of that information. Um, at least when you compare to like years in the past, uh, working with other farmers and other cultivation scenarios, um, I do often work with folks that are um, older than I am um, and maybe are not super uh, tuned in to some of the like empirical sources of information um, or they might be very sort of um, traditionalist and don't really want to change into using like biocontrols, for example, and not using certain chemical applications uh, or something to that effect, or even like new technologies for that matter, or even old technologies that have been sort of refined. Um, some of which is the kind of stuff that you work on, for example, Marco. Um, so I'm uh, here to facilitate that empirical research. I try to base a lot of my work in that regard and I also like to characterize my IPM as a uh, holistic. And I'm a big supporter of the regenerative agriculture, sorry, and living soil um, uh, disciplines and, and sort of movements, because I do think that an ecologically conscientious and sort of sustainable mindset when it comes to cultivation is not only important for the short term, but also the deep long term. And I'm always excited to work with people who are trying to work with the environment trying to find um, sort of techniques and defenses and things like this that can be, um, that can at least cohabitate with your local environment. Very nice, very nice. Um, so you said something that um, somebody reached out to me and they said, you know, make sure you ask him about regenerative agriculture. And I said, well, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure everyone loves regenerative agriculture and um, so I don't know, maybe you had a conversation with someone and it kind of led to um, indigenous IPM. Do you um, mm -hmm. are you kind of familiar with the, any techniques that people can use or ways to kind of collect uh, in any of the indigenous IPM? Like, you know, some of the things that may, we may normally have to buy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm uh, particularly excited that people are interested in things like banker plants and um, and even in the cannabis space and even in cases where it wouldn't be like plants on the ground in like a field scenario, but even um, in, in like potted plants and that sort of a thing, uh, attracting native um, species of biocontrols and uh, beneficial insects and, and mice and that sort of a thing. Uh, I spent a lot of time making videos on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, 
where I go over and I make observational footage about the pests and also the beneficials like uh, hoverflies, for example, would be would be one thing that I think a lot of people, I guess those and parasitic wasps, like if you grow, um, you know, plants like um, alyssum, like sweet alyssum is a pretty popular one. Uh, but also uh, if you're trying to grow like native plants in your area that will attract some of the parasitoid wasps and predatory flies and um, and beetles and things like this that can um, sort of do that work for you in your local space um, is always gonna have uh, benefits for you in that way. And it also helps facilitate the native ecosystem. Um, so in, in that way, I am familiar with certain techniques. Banker plants are a big one. Um, I also, although this is not quite the same thing as, as really their attraction, I think it's really, really important to be able to monitor the things outside uh, and do it, doing it in as little a destructive way as possible as well. Because um, when you're monitoring for pests, it's, it's commonplace for people to use things like yellow sticky traps. And, and not that those are like evil or anything, but uh, if you don't know what you're dealing with, you might misinterpret some of those things as sort of pests when they're really just neutral. Um, for example, a lot of people don't know that uh, most people, when they think of pollinators, they think of like honeybees particularly, but um, native bees are the really important ones and they're the ones that are also the most endangered. Uh, at the same time, um, flies, believe it or not, are actually, and, and certain parasitic wasps for that matter, are really important pollinators too. Or not just pollinators, but uh, nectivores and, and uh, facilitators of plant health. So when you're facilitating those organisms, you're also facilitating the, the things that are going to defend you, not only in your local space, but also um, in, your, in the area of surrounding, because you are kind of becoming a bastion for those people. And when I've worked with people like uh, Moon Made Farms, for example, you know, I was, very, um, I was very happy to do so because I felt like they were growing in a way that was sustainable and they were growing in a way and and facilitating a mindset that was uh, sort of interacting with their local environment in a in a conducive way, in a facilitative way. Very cool. Just one more thing, since we were you mentioned uh, hoverflies, um, I kind of stumbled and and you know that hoverflies maggots actually live in water, and they have their tail is actually like a snorkel or a siphon. And I stumbled upon that by accident. I had a um, pot that had like some um, tulip bulbs in it and it got just rained on. And I think that everything in the pot started decomposing. Well, I went to dump this watery, soily, mushy mix out and I noticed all these rat tail maggots and I come to find out they're hoverfly. Uh, that's how their maggots live. So I took that information and I'm now trying to develop a way to, you know, kind of make you know get them to breed on my property still haven't quite dialed that in yet um but are you you familiar with um kind of the hoverfly life cycle and, and, and good ways that would attract them in, in that way yeah absolutely um you know it's actually particularly fitting that you came across the rat-tailed uh maggots for particular there are a couple of um subfamilies of syrphidae which is the hoverfly family that um produce these rat tail maggots and that siphon that tail is a siphon for air and they feed on microbes um and like bacteria and things kind of in the in the um in the water but the predatory hoverflies that people are really um most commonly using in agricultural spaces they produce larvae that are predatory and exist in the in the phylosphere on the foliage and uh usually their eggs are laid um, near like colonies of aphids. A lot of them feed on aphids, not all of them do. Some of them even feed on, and that's a great example here, um, for a rat-tailed maggot. So that's the, the siphon at the end of the tail there. And they use that to, to breathe in a very um, sort of hypoxic environment with very low oxygen. Um, some, some larvae, in fact, I have a video on my channel about, uh, a thick, I think it's called a thick-legged hoverfly or big-legged hoverfly or something like this and uh, they lay their eggs in compost and the larvae actually uh, feed on the decaying wood 
uh, if you have like a woody material, I suppose you could say. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. Hoverflies are super diverse and um, that's, you know, that is, that's the thing is that all the adults can sometimes have bright colors uh, that make them look like bees or wasps, but that's just mimicry so that things leave them alone. But you can always tell a hoverfly because they like to hover in place and they kind of zip around in these sort of controlled bursts a lot of the time. So in case people don't know if they've actually encountered them, a lot of times they mistake them for other organisms entirely. Oh yeah, I see a lot of people that post them and say, look at this bee on my flower. I just have yes. to say, that's a hoverfly. I just can't let it pass. <laughs> exactly. I really help, it's really appreciative that we have these pictures to, to really show people. Because part of a big part of it is, uh, like you were saying, identifying and just like knowing what it is, what it looks like. Um, you know, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And uh, I'm a high advocate of that. Uh, you know, it's something that you taught me, Matthew, and um, as I continued, you know, I reached out to you, I felt like a s several months later, and then you graciously gave me like as much information that I could really find on the internet about the rove beetle. Uh, I felt like when I was mm. starting to understand that, especially in an indoor environment, it was a game changer for me, especially for, you know, relatively pretty cheap, uh, especially as you were learning how to, to kind of build up those colonies. So I was hoping uh, for, our, for our newer viewers, if you could kind of go over why the rove beetle seems to be uh, paramount, I guess, into at least your planning stages uh, when you're wanting to build a living soil system. There are a lot of different ho uh, hoverflies. There are a lot of different rove beetles too, for that matter. Um, uh, so not all of them are predatory. So in a living soil situation, I, I just want to stress that not every single rope beetle that you might attract to your environment is necessarily going to be predatory. A lot of them look very similar. Some of them eat fungi. Um, some of them eat um, a, a little bit of plant material even sometimes, but most of them, a lot of them are predatory or detrivorous. So uh, rove beetles are great because they're very, I would say, you know, this is not a very scientific way of saying it, but they're very robust. Um, I know that in certain urban ecology um, uh, research reports, if I'm remembering right, they tend to actually work really well because they can, they actually do have wings, believe it or not. Um, and for a long time, I hadn't seen one fly ever. I knew that they could, but I had never seen it. And uh, they, and they are able to like kind of move from like one patch of land to another patch of land. And that's what makes them kind of robust, even in like human centric areas. So for a lot of people, they can be one of the easiest things to encounter, even in an environment that might have been disturbed or in some ways, um, you know, altered by like uh, by human, um, you know, creation of structures and things like this. Uh, but the reason why they're paramount is because they're generalists. Um, so like I said, some of them are detrivores and some of them are predators and both of them can work in tandem to um, you know, to, to be in those niches that are useful for you. On top of that, you've already mentioned predatory mites. So like, uh, you know, Pacumaris and Swirsky and those sorts of things that are commercially available, sure. But there are tons of other ones that uh, pretty much look identical and um, will have a similar sort of either omnivorous or detrivorous um, sort of a, a feeding guild, as we like to say. And those two together can be a really nice sort of generalized um, uh, sort of predator complex. They can go after a lot of things in your soil and on the soil, but they can't go super deep into the soil, I should say. And then I, I feel like a lot of people are using that in conjunction with the, the hypiosis miles or now it's, you know, something skidamous. Um, can we kind of talk about why, you know, as you're building your, your blueprint here, why you want to kind of figure out who's going to work in a symbiotic relationship so that you can continue to, in a way, almost improve on Mother Nature with your farmer brain, uh, deciding what uh, beneficial insects, predatory mites that you had just mentioned, uh, you're going to allow into that and continue to, to build up that defense system. Uh, I feel like that's something that, especially as a new farmer, like you had mentioned at the beginning of the show, it, it sounds like, oh, I'm not going to get these uh, issues that I hear a lot of these people say. I, you know, I, I keep everything healthy and clean. Uh, but the reality is, is that you're going to face that at some point, especially if you're at the commercial level. Absolutely. And even at the home grower level, um, I get asked more about springtails 
various predatory mites and um, like kind of mold mites or, or, or dust mites or tyrophagus type mites um, more than I even get asked for about pests because people who are excited about living soil, like you say, are um, maybe not experienced in dealing with insects in general. And their only experience has been like pests like cockroaches and things. And so they have this immediate uh, sort of visceral reaction uh, that is to kill it because they don't know what they're even looking at. And I think that's kind of sad um, in, in a way that's very unfortunate that people aren't familiar with so many good and even just neutral uh, insect life. Um, and sort of a lot of times people are killing beneficials that are actually going to help you out. So again, I think it's very important for people to be able to uh, identify these organisms. A lot of times you don't even need, need a microscope for that matter. Um, and also like with the predatory mites and the springtails and things like this, they don't usually have a, um, a problem for the plant life that you're growing. And they don't usually, um, and I say that very specifically, um, they, they're usually not going to have a lot of what we call um, intraguild uh, predation or intraguild predation, right? Where uh, like a predatory mite is going to affect another beneficial, for example. That does happen to some degree sometimes, but uh, usually you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, and facilitating one species over another, or one sort of complex over another, um, oftentimes just comes down to, especially with predators, just having enough prey source. Some of these mold mites and springtails that I'm talking about are oftentimes just such a food source. And so it becomes a question of uh, taking sort of like visual samples and even like taking some soil samples uh, of your cultivation space, taking a look at what you have there and um, being able to tell, you know, because you have this foreknowledge, well, this is a springtail that you go after. They, they eat these sorts of things. Um, you know, I have a sort of nematodes perhaps in the soil as well. Um, and uh, for example, uh, you know, although they're not necessarily focused a lot, uh, ants are a big thing in various ecosystems. So if I'm talking to people in various parts of the world, they might interact with different kinds of ants that we don't necessarily do in North America, for example. Uh, and beetles are also really common in the soil, depending on which ecosystem we're talking about. Glad you mentioned beetles. I, ahead, I just bro. wanted to, yeah, real quick, Margo. So the the biggest problem that I feel like, especially me, you know, was trying to get the rove beetle to reproduce. Um, there's a couple videos. Shout out to I believe it's Red Bud Soil Company put together something where he's talking about feeding them oatmeal. I've tried that a couple times. Uh, and to be fair with this, I, I personally just didn't really have success with it. I wasn't sure if the, you know, I'm missing certain things. So I started out a little more protein, a little bit more chitin uh, in the form of like insect frass, um, black soldier fly larvae. And then how, are, are there a few other little things that we could add to get these things to reproduce? Because in the world that I'm now with, with more of like the isopods and that kind of thing, again, the rove beetle is the, the tried and true, it seems like, um, beneficial that I can personally see with the naked eye of improvements, you know, as I continue to build the worm farms, how do I improve that system, adding the red wigglers, and for the most part, adding healthy compost, and some rove beetles, and it seems like give that a few weeks and everything starts to churn out. Are there ways mm -hmm. to maybe speed that up or improve that system, get them to breed a little bit uh, quicker and maybe a little more robust? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, I'm sorry if I sort of pontificated on something and went on a tangent, I do that sometimes. But um, for the rove beetles, I think that it sounds like you already have kind of a good idea, basically giving them sort of a food source. Sometimes with predators, you don't always get the opportunity to use sort of a, um, like a substitute food source, uh, like you might do for the predatory mites. Um, they often are fed on feeder mites, for example. So if you have a culture of those, um, that can be very useful. But if you're applying them in like a red wriggler sort of vermicompost scenario, um, I guess, I actually, I, I think that maybe the biggest factor might just simply be things like temperature and humidity and keeping those ratios sort of good, by which I mean like a little bit more hotter, which will make the, the entire process of their life cycle quicker, uh, generally speaking. Um, as long as you have something of a food source, the predator, particularly if we're talking about predators like Delosia uh, coriaria, 
Um, that's like the greenhouse rogue beetle that most people are familiar with, but there's like so many different kinds. And if you're using those, well, they're predators and they really require um, a certain amount of their prey for the population to be stable. And there's not really much of a way to get ahead of that unless you have, like I said, some kind of a um, an alternate food source. And off the top of my head, I can't think of one personally. Now, I did notice that they will eat the springtail. So is that a, that's okay, kind of just, that's the process that's going down and maybe that's just nature taking care of itself and building things up. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I do know that, I mean, uh, in terrariums, just speaking of which, like I, I'm, I'm excited that there's a lot more predatory mites being utilized uh, in like reptiles, for example. And uh, I know that there's some research in, in even for honeybees in, um, in the use of like, I think it was hypoaspis or stradiolalaps or something like this. I want to say that they were trialing them for varroa mite and uh, they were somewhat useful. They didn't affect the uh, adult varroa mites on the honeybees um, because they were too big and, uh, you know, strong, but the predatory mites were able to go after like small little nymphs. So um, there are some expanding uses for these predatory mites, even outside of the like direct plant cultivation world. Absolutely. They're calling it bioactive. To go for, for. Um, feather wing beetles. Uh, when I built oh, yeah. my living, yeah, I built my living soil, uh, my last latest indoor living soil, and um, I noticed a high amount of feather wing beetles, which is fine. Um, they're not causing me any any trouble. Um, but for folks that don't know, that's like the I think it's the smallest species of beetle that exists, um, and some of them are, I mean, very small. Um, I noticed them a lot, you know just where everything else and, you know, kind of right under that leaf, uh, you know, mulch layer. Uh, so it looks like they're just eating, eating away in there. What do you, um, you got any experience with the little feather wing beetles, Matthew? I don't have a whole lot of experience with them. Um, not really. I am usually not stumped, uh, <laughs> uh, you're not, but, uh, just so that I know, you're not talking about the twisted wing beetles, right? No, um, uh, uh Coleoptera, uh, but today, Tidity. Oh, tidility or whatever. Let me just yeah. look that up really quickly. Yeah, they're they're one of they're the tiniest uh, of your beetles, and I had never really noticed them in any living soils I built before um, until this latest one I built here on my property, and they seem to be hanging in there pretty cool. They're they're soil dwelling. Is that what you said, Mark? Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're soil dwelling, tiny little. Apparently, beetles. wow, not to talk over you, but apparently they're part of the. There must be, they're very closely related to rogue beetles. Mm -hmm. They must be because they're right there. They share the same habitat when I, you know, run Appreciate avocado that attack. Nugget, dog. Yes, sir. I yes, sir. More, I need more predators in these streets. Yeah, man, those <laughs> feather wings. I could probably get those babies breeding. They're real active in my soul. So we'll look at it. Do you ever get um, dermestid beetles? Uh, like the ones that'll eat, like, well, they'll eat like detritus and like hair and things like that. Uh, museums use them to decompose or to clean out like skeletons and things. Um, I find that sometimes uh, people will get those in like worm bins and um, and other sorts of like, I guess you could say like bio bioreactors, so to speak. Let me ID them. What are they called again? The dermestid beetles or um, I think it is dermestidity. Okay, yeah, they're mustard beetles. Yeah, like the the varied carpet beetle on Wikipedia is like the, like, you know, typical example. People, I have gotten people asking me, um, you know, oh, what's this bug? And I'm like, don't worry about it. It's just a it's a household pest, for example, rather than being a plant pest. That happens too. Yeah, it's all good until you track it into your house, right? <laughs> right. In your opinion, Matthew, if you're using really high-end compost, you're going to naturally probably get a lot of these things that we are mentioning, correct? It certainly could happen. I think it would depend on how you're, you know, how you're constructing it and all that. But theoretically, if you're using high high quality inputs, you could potentially get a few of these things. You might have to obviously add some that weren't there, uh, but you don't necessarily have to go a la carte. Uh, and, and get all of these things from insectaries or something like that if you're focused on building or, or buying high-end compost. 
Oh yeah, no. Um, it's amazing. Like, um, well, actually, I wanted to talk with Marco about this at some point in the future, and maybe um, it would be interesting to do that. But uh, when I was cultivating black soldier fly larvae uh, myself in the protopod or the biopod, uh, they I, I would get a bunch of non black soldier fly organisms in there, and uh, they were some of them were predators that were attracted uh, to the larvae. Some of them were ex were uh, attracted to like like leaf litter or things that are were around it um and the humidity inside as well some like long-legged like wood larval feeding flies and things like that and it's amazing what can happen if you've got a compost pile like things will come out that you've never even thought about uh before in your life and that's also why i stress identification so much yeah that diversity man it's like um it's something about building soils and compost outdoors you know what i mean it just the it just they call it just calls in all the all the biology and that's just like those feather wing beetles you know that they I, I didn't bring those in and the only thing i did add when i built my soil was uh predatory road beetles and i assume they were in there i saw road beetles i weren't sure if they were predator types or what if they're fungal eaters or what they were so i just went ahead and bought a batch you know a small bit to throw in there um but I, I probably wouldn't have even had to do that you know just being making things outdoors you just kind of get everything for free you know it's kind of that's, that's the dope part about it yeah that's why i was kind of breaking that up so that people can see like you know if you really think this through and, and continue your education before you start spending a lot of money uh, there's a mm. lot of ways that you can minimize things because I know for me personally, when we were really getting into using predatory mites uh, as, uh, you know, as being proactive in IPM cannabis protocols and that kind of thing, I think we were using a lot of the wrong mites for our environment. We were spending a lot of money, it felt like, you know, especially, you know, the larger facilities are working with a variety of people. It seems like uh, some predatory mites seem to stick around where others even if you still had the problem, it seemed like they weren't able to take hold. So are there some that you would recommend that you feel like are tried and true uh, for, you know, an, an indoor environment, mostly also probably a greenhouse environment? You'll hear me say this a lot, which is the phrase, it depends, and it is context dependent. I like to say that a lot too. But um, if we get past that, uh, general, there are some like generalist predatory mites from a commercial sp perspective that you can buy that, I, that I'm a fan of. So your Cucumeris, your Swirskii, your Stradiolalap slash Hypoaspis um, mites as well. Um, those are uh, variously, I think, type 3 and type 4 so-called Phytoceidae, which is the family of mites that a lot of predatory mites come from. And I have, a I have a few videos that kind of go into depth about type 1 through type 4 and how, which ones are which and what do they go after and, and what does the classification mean and who do they play nice with? Um, but I'm a fan of those because they are such big generalists. The type threes in particular, like Kukumaris and Swirsky, um, they go after everything from various moth eggs, uh, for example, though I wouldn't count on them to control your moth population. Um, sometimes they'll like munch on some spider mites and things, but they're not really a hard counter for them. But they'll also go after things like thrips, at various uh, mostly nymphal life stages and eggs. Um, they'll go after um, russet mites and broad mites, which are huge in the cannabis space, right? Um, or at least the first two, I should say, the Swirsiganica is less so the Stradiolalaps. Something else that I've been learning about in the soil system, and Marco, this question is to you too, sir, are something called orbital mites. Are you guys familiar with that? And what, what are those doing in the soil system from your perspective? Oribitid mites are oh. really, um, they're really great. Uh, they're, I think that I was actually just looking into them uh, recently because um, they're very, they're very big part of like ecological processes. Like we, like, I mean, that's very general and abstract. What I mean to say is that um, they're, they're oftentimes an indicator species or a group. I keep thinking of species in uh, the context of certain insects, but they're a, they're a massive group. There's many species of them, but the ribitata are usually indicators of like, um, you know, a lack of certain kinds of pollutants and like a forest environment, things like that. Um, I think that the, the like Greek or Latin that their name comes from means like mountain 
dwelling or mountain traveling mites or something like this. And uh, they, um, they'll feed on and they'll break down a lot of the like leaf litter and um, they'll bioturbate. So they will go through the soil and through the processing of food um, and that food gets processed and gets deposited uh, in various parts of the soil. And so it kind of helps to like integrate um, and like expand the soil um, sort of matrix and like the nutrient yeah, there we go. That's great. A lot of them sort of had this characteristic, like teardrop shaped body. And um, those are, that's a really great example of what they look like under a, at least under a microscope. Yeah, yeah they, they seem like they, they hitch a ride too. Sorry, Michael. That's funny you said that, Brian. Um, I was going to say the same thing when I, uh, I noticed them, I noticed their populations got, um, well, let me back up. In worm bins, if you guys, if, if you've noticed, if you ever overwatered or fed too much wet food, you can get a flourish of these red mites. Those are those same mites we're talking about, the orbited, orbited mites. Um, so one thing I noticed in my soil was when I first built it, I, they started to flourish. They got really, uh, the population got pretty high to the point that they were actually four or five of them would be riding on top of these feather wing beetles which were in the soil <laughs> and, you know, and I would, you know, just messing with them, try to, you know, flick them off, just see what, what they're up to, you know, what are they, what are they doing? Are they, are they were literally just taking a ride, Matthew? I, I couldn't figure it, out what they're up to, man. Absolutely. They can be, there's this, um, there's this behavior called foresy. That's P H O R E S Y. I believe, uh, but phoretic mites or phoretic behavior is when an organism, like you just said, they just hitch a ride. Um, there are some uh, burying beetles, uh, and this is interesting. Where I don't think they're arbitrated mites in particular, but um, even certain like omnivorous mites that look more like a like a hypoaspis mite than like an arbitrated mite, um, they will just literally get onto the carrion beetles, uh, and and apparently, it's a sim it's a mutualistic symbiosis. The mites are transferred to a place where there's going to be some decomposing like animal matter because that's what the burying beetles do. And then they lay their eggs in it. Uh, but also apparently the mites provide a, a really big use to the, um, to the beetle because it actually, they use them like a coat. They retain heat um, as they're moving along, um, which is kind of fascinating to me if I'm remembering correctly the relationship. Um, so like cool things like that happen where, um, it's not just a ride. There's actually a symbiosis going on. And now, so one thing that I thought, and now that you said that, I don't feel crazy saying this, but I noticed that they were mostly towards the back end of the beetle. So I'm like, hmm. are they like, you know, like, you know, taking that beetle's shit and processing it? Like, are they, is that why they're back there? Or I thought maybe that's where the beetles wing casings were and, and mm. maybe they're eating something that kind of was getting under the wing casings. It's just, I couldn't figure it out, man. So many things that are mystery every time I look in the soil. Yeah. It, it can be hard to tell. Sometimes you can even get parasites sometimes um, as well, but uh, the spectrum between mutualist and parasite can be a little bit blurry. You know, sometimes they're, it's like with uh, butterflies, right? Like, like a monarch butterfly, the caterpillar eats the leaves off of the milkweed, which is not great for the plant, but then it comes back and pollinates it along with other plants or other pollinators too. Um, so there is kind of this sort of mutualism, but it, it's costly. Mutualism can be costly. Hmm. Very true. Very true. Uh, one of the other beneficials that I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I, I never got them to breed uh, was the assassin bug. Do you feel like cannabis mm. environment is um, ready for that kind of uh, bug jumping around, or do you feel like that's wasted money? I feel like assassin bugs definitely have a place. Um, it depends on which ones we're talking about, but um, I think the reason why they're sort of difficult to deal with is because they, um, well, they're kind of like an apex predator type organism. So, so you got to think that for any individual to go from nymph to adult, it has to feed on at least a bare minimum of X 
prey items that are why you know mass i guess you could say if you really want to break it down and um usually they're and oftentimes they're cannibalistic because of this because there's not always enough food to go around especially when they're just coming out of their egg case so i think it's difficult to um sort of uh breed them or certain or like propagate them like for multiple generations and say in the same way that you would do so for like uh predatory mites by like having pollen as a banker plant and having the omnivorous mites feed on the pollen and 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 continue on in a way um so that it kind of be, it can be difficult um and they often go after as they get older they have to go after like more and more macroscopic prey so like caterpillars and and other sorts of things, even some beneficials, like they won't, they won't like recognize a hoverfly, like, oh, you're on the good guy team with the cultivator, I'll leave you alone, or honeybees for that matter, or other sorts of things, they'll go after them too. Good points. I feel like when you, when you, um, this reminds me of a post I saw like, was real, like last week, this guy it was a picture of a ladybug, the shell was partially damaged, and his caption was something like, the last of 200 ladybugs which i put in my grow and he has the battle scars to prove it well in my mind i thought really it's the last one that found some food to eat because you know i think it's been proven now that ladybugs indoors isn't like a sustainable thing you know i feel like if an insect is out of the soil like we mentioned some small insects like the road beetles and the feather wing beetles, those guys are in the soil. That's their world. But I feel like a bug or an insect, like a, um, you know, wheel bug or an assassin bug. Now, if he's in a greenhouse, I feel like that world is not big enough to sustain a population of them. And I say that because when I see them out and about, they're sporadic, you know, they're not a very densely populated um, predator. And I think it's like kind of like a lion. They have to have a certain amount of space for each pride of lions to be able to have enough food to, 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 to sustain. So I think it's tough. And that's kind of my experience. I'm not saying it's impossible. But I think it'd be kind of tough. The larger. No, you, you make a good point. Um, it's, it's absolutely true with regards to like predators. Uh, they have to have prey and they have to like lady beetles, right? Um, you know, you've got the, the larval form has to go through certain instars and then they get become, then they pupate and become an adult. And even that adult has to feed, you know, and has to locate a place for um, it to put the eggs into. But it's also dealing with a bunch of other things, how hungry it is. It's dealing with, you know, chemical reactions in the air, or rather chemical molecules, chemical molecules, molecular compounds in the air that signal to it like, oh, maybe there's prey here. Oh, maybe there's herbivore-induced plant volatiles. Oh, maybe that's an aphid colony. Well, let me fly over there. Flying is costly too, um, you know. Like it's it's. If you ever seen like the slow down videos of like a of any really insect, they like it's it's not a very graceful thing. It's uh, it looks graceful to us because it happens so quickly, uh, but that also costs so much power for them to even lift off, let alone like fly like a few meters one direction or another. So there's all these resources being managed in order for them to be successful. And you're right. If they don't have that, then they die or they cannibalize their part, you know, their other species if they can, not all of them can even do that. And if you've never seen a rove beetle fly, you can check out uh, Matthew's um, YouTube channel. I feel like you're one of the few people on, it seems like all of Google uh, that has some of these unique um, uh, videos. Uh, so shout out to that, man. Cause I, I'd never seen a, a rove beetle uh, fly until I, I learned more about you and your channel. I appreciate that. You know, on that note, rove beetles are very unique. They, um, unlike any other insect, uh, they have to fold their wings in a very specific way in order to have it fit under that sort of square elytra or like wing cover that they have, uh, it which is pretty me of crazy. like a high end convertible. Mm. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just yeah. push the button, it goes back. So I encourage you guys to check out that video. I, I feel like that's a cool little way to, to break it down. And uh, I'm glad that we're able to continue to talk about these because, you know, for a lot of us, we were just kind of buying these things and then hoping and praying that they worked. And for, you know, a lot of us, I felt like, especially at the beginning, we spent and wasted a lot of money on this. 
Um, and I would say that we weren't really talking about potentially getting a majority of these or hopefully getting a majority of these from high end compost. Uh, something else that I wanted to to kind of ask you about was um, and shout out to Sasquatch 305. He's the one that taught me about this credit where credit is due. Uh, but it seemed like the jumping spider is something that is um, starting to also take off in the reptile world, starting to to be kind of a secret sauce, if you will, for IPM for certain uh, commercial farmers. They don't leave that silky webbing. Uh, they're going around um, proactively looking for for um, prey. Uh, so I was hoping we could dive deeper into that uh, with you as well, Marco. Did oh, you yeah. say Marco? Or oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, both of you guys. There, both of like us. Both, yeah. Well, let me give you my little two cents on uh, jumping spiders. I love them. Um, I currently have jumping spiders you know, in my house um, that have been there for a couple of years at least. Like, it's they're very smart <laughs> like you know it's not like they're my pets but i'll see if i see them jumping spider i just leave them like i don't bother them i let them do their thing i think they are something that could be sustainable in the greenhouse because if they run out of food they find ways to get outside or or somewhere else they're pretty they're pretty clever in that way but i like jumping spiders i think they're pretty dope yeah i have to agree with that um i encourage people to not kill them when they encounter them. Uh, also the same for, for a lot of spiders too. Um, I'm biased because I grew up in North America uh, and there's really not a whole lot of insect life that is, um, or even arthropod life like spiders that are what we might call like medically significant. There are some, and especially because they might tra transmit pathogens. Uh, but yeah, jumping spiders are not gonna hurt you. Um, and like you say, Marco, they are very intelligent. Look, you know, they're very inquisitive, right? They've got this very inquisitive, like spark to them that I think makes them very endearing. Um, uh, in fact, I'm, uh, uh, occasionally when I have the time, I sometimes I've been playing this new video game that came out called webbed and it's about a Maratus jumping spider, which are the peacock jumping spiders that shake their abdomen and dance. If you haven't mm -hmm. seen videos of this. I also highly encourage you to check those out because um, they're pretty fun. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of like they're very charismatic, what we call a charismatic fauna, you know, like Bambi is a charismatic megafauna. So, you know, it's cute. It's We associate with all kinds of cultural things and, and sorts of stuff like that. And so we find them endearing. Uh, whereas other things um, like wasps and certain kinds of spiders like the Black Widow, uh, you know, we have the very opposite effect a lot of the time. And uh, I just want to encourage people to not indiscriminately kill uh, arthropods and, and things like that, because they, they serve a bunch of ecological um, uh, roles for the environment. And if we kill them, then we're not going to have those roles and you're going to have a, a system that collapses. And um, I guess I also want to say that I have a video on my YouTube channel that goes over one of the really common ones that I see around here in San Diego, which is uh, the gray jumper. And uh, the family of for spider mites, uh, spider mites, ha, we can talk about that later too. <laughs> the family for jumping spiders is the salticity. And they're actually, I think they're the most speciose family of spider, just beating out a different family. Um, so not only are they kind of smart and inquisitive and uh, really good predators, their success has allowed them to speciate across like a ton of different um, individual groups. Yeah, they come in all shapes and sizes. I found one on an outdoor plant out here on my property, a, a metallic go, a metallic green jumping spider. That's a beautiful jumping spider. And there's also one, uh, it's either red back or red tail. It's all black and mm. its abdomen is red. I mean, it's beautiful. Like if you guys really start, just take your time, start looking at these things like, you know, don't be so afraid. You you don't want to get ten feet away from a spider. I mean, that, you know, you can get close to, to these things and, and and observe them, guys. You know, like like Matthew said, look to bring life. Don't look to try, take life away. And if you don't know what something is, walk away from it. Figure out what it is, and then you know, let it live at least and give it a chance. Maybe something beneficial. I was surprised how long they live as well. 
Uh, yeah. There's some people that breed them, like Marco had mentioned, I guess there's so many of these ones that are exotic where I, I've seen the one gentleman uh, was selling some of them for like $75 a piece, uh, talking about that they live for like two years or so. So um, you don't necessarily obviously have to get that one to uh, protect your plants, but it seems like there's just a huge variety of these things. So going down the rabbit hole, I think uh, jumping spiders is where it's at. Now, both of you had mentioned intelligence. Um, from my personal uh, experience, I think the, the most highly intelligent kind of lion, Marco, like if you will, uh, seemed to be the praying mantis. I was hoping we could kind of go deeper into that as well, because it did seem like the praying mantis was the only one that was out hunting the, the jumping spider from my experience. Yeah, um, I want to say that with regards to intelligence, uh, it's kind of interesting to see the behavioral differences between kind of uh, arachnids and insects and things like this uh it seems like i think that i think i've heard it quoted that that certain jumping spider brains are like the size of like a poppy seed mm. which is crazy and if i'm assuming that i'm getting that right um they have all of these various processes that they can go through for hunting behavior and learning uh, despite their brains being so small or at least maybe even a certain part of their brain perhaps um Insects, so insect neurology, insect brains, and their and also their vision is something that I've talked about on other live streams that I have on my channel, and I'm a big fan of those like deep, heady physiological topics. Um, they have these brains, mantises too, for that matter, have these brain, these parts of their brains called mushroom bodies, and honeybees have them too, um, and uh, that's a bit that those like uh, outgrowths are really important for processing the various stimuli they get from their antennae or whatever other sort of like sensilla or other, um, you know, uh, sensory hairs or, or um, other organs like that that are there for that, as well as their visual um, uh, information too. Um, mantises, for those who don't know, actually, it's kind of a funny story. Um, Praying mantids share a line with cockroaches and termites. Um, termites actually are descended from wood-eating cockroaches. All termites are. And praying mantids and roaches, uh, you know, they diverged a long time ago, but they did used to share the same common ancestor. So they're very closely related. And uh, I just think that kind of stuff is fascinating when you consider how, like, and arguably, you know, cockroaches, they get a lot of hate, but they're also admired, at least for the fact that they're so tenacious and they are so uh, <laughs> survivor, you know, oriented. And so I guess you could, you know, if you wanted to, you know, narrativize it, something that is uh, adapted to always surviving eventually became so good at it that it became a really extremely um predacious insect like the praying mantis group does um you know they uh i don't know what to say more than that really i just remember my buddy frank and i when we were first messing around with these things shout out to frank uh we were able to to take a take some mushrooms and just sat down there for hours watching this thing hunt ladybugs just the precision of it uh, the the way that it obviously knows to like turn the ladybug and, and eat its head for or brains first seemed to be just uh, I, I almost like uh i just didn't understand the level of intelligence uh of that creature so it's it's just kind of fun to be able to sit here and nerd out on bugs man because for a They're long almost long like time, a robot <laughs> yeah yeah right the, the eyes and everything how they notice you and then um you know for the ones in the at least in the indoor environment if there is ladybugs or something that they continue to uh, can be able to eat. Uh, it does seem like those are also uh, ones that will live for like a year or two years. And that's where I was able to almost have like a, a friendship, if you will. Like I felt like they knew that I wasn't there to harm them and they would just kind of sit there and guard the plants. And it seemed like as long as maybe this is again with like the lion analogy, if they didn't get too close to each other and there was enough of a food source, they wouldn't eat each other either. Once they, it seemed like once they were both adults, uh, when I would first release these egg sacs, I always called that the battle royale. And it seemed mm -hmm. like the real strong alphas would emerge. Uh, they would then turn from brown to pink. 
Uh, that seemed like their teenage, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong here, Matthew. This is all just me watching this. They would then sure. turn to like a, a pinker color, start to go up and down the cannabis plant. And then once they were adults, that's when they would turn uh, brown or green. At least those were the ones that I was messing with from the, the pet stores and that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's when, you know, for the most part, they would almost become like a guard dog and uh, hopefully live for like a year or two. Mm -hmm. The thing that makes uh, mantises so good at what they do, and arguably, uh, you know, and you can see in this picture, this is a great representation. I don't know what species this is, but if I had to guess, it's probably like a Chinese mantis or something. They're very, very, very common. Um, but it could be like a, a stag, a stagno mantis, stagno. I, man, I'm I am forgetting my genus names. But uh, if you look at their eyes. You know, they have two kinds of eyes. You can't see it very well in this picture, but they have the big regular compound eyes on either side of the face that gives them a really good perspective around them. And then they also have three eyes here, which are called ocelli. And those help with looking at things like, depending on what insect we're talking about, polarized light. Um, they can tell light and dark really well and other changes and possibly, depending on, you know, different insects have different adaptations with these simple uh, eyes, but um, they both kind of work in unison to give them a really great picture around them. And they're really great at motion detection. Arthropod eyes have generally uh, incredibly terrible, from our perspective, um, visual acuity. Their resolution is terrible. Um, whereas we can see details at a very fine degree. And for mammals too, humans have incredibly good eyesight. Um, for those who don't know, right, just from our color, our ability to pick up certain kinds of color. Um, but yeah, so insects, what they lack in resolution, they gain in being able to tell looming, like distance, like coming forward towards them or away from them and their ability to tell like movement uh, in general. Uh, and we're, we also are adapted to that too, sort of visual changes, but we can also like we can like look at something camouflaged and be like, no, that pattern isn't right. You know, but for them, they don't really have that ability yeah, so much. Mm -hmm. And then the coolest one I've ever seen is the, the orchid uh, mantis. Have you seen that one? Oh they're yeah. Beautiful. Have oh, you seen those devil's idea. mantises or whatever they're called? I, that's what I was hoping to geek out with you today. You were going to probably start <laughs> rattling off stuff I've never heard. The devil, Same I haven't market. heard of that one. Right? I think uh, we, when you get into some of this stuff, it really is fun. And it's really unique to see what some of the stuff exists on the on the forest floor. Uh, or just, you know, how Mother Nature kind of combats Mother Nature with, the, with a variety of things. Uh, something oh, else yeah. that I wanted to kind of get into was, um, yeah, there, there we go. Goes. Now, so from what I understand, those, are wild those live those, for a though. while. Oh, that's true, though. Yeah. Uh, so what, do you have knowledge on, like, uh, carnivorous plants? Like, the one that I, I personally like to use is called, like, monkey cup or pitcher plant. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any experience with that? And are there certain um, insects uh, that we, we could, you know, feed that to kind of speed up the health of that plant? Uh, it seems like they are protein hungry, but... I. I was also told never to overfeed the pitcher plant. Oh yeah, that's a good point. So um, I do have some experience with uh, pitcher plants and Venus flytraps and sundews. Um, so I think you would have to have a ton of them to be really useful in like a like in a biocontrol perspective. Um, and the other thing that we should keep in mind is that um, carnivory plants and pre-carnivory or pre-carnivorous sort of, you know, proto-carnivory development in plants um, oftentimes has stemmed from a poor nutrient in the soil, particularly nitrogen. And so plants that adapted in such a way to, um, and of course, when we look at something like a Venus flytrap or a pitcher plant or a sundew even, like these, these are, you know, this has happened for a very long time and has become very specialized. But essentially, uh, Plants that are able to trap or in some way like aggregate uh, insect or some other sort of animal material that's like nutritionous uh, allowed them to be more competitive than 
you know, their peers essentially than other or other plants around them. And so over a long time, this became an adaptation, like for the sundew, for example, it's got a bunch of small uh, trichomes or large trichomes that are bulbous and sticky and they react to motion. So when a fly comes in and, and, and lands on the, uh, the sticky, possibly even attractive substance on them, um, they are wrapped together in these uh, trichomes and then they're pulled into the plant for digestion. Um, and so they're kind of enveloped. And Venus flytraps do that and pitcher plants do that too, to some degree. Um, they digest the or uh, the insect inside um, and that gives them nitrogen. But you, could, you wouldn't be able to like give them, and so over this period of time, they've, they've relied on the nitrogen source from the insects. Uh, you would never want to like, uh, fertilize them with a nitrogen um, a fertilizer, for example. And you even have to be really careful with how you water them because they've adapted to an environment that's a uh, sort of nitrogen poor and also poor in other nutrients, but they now can feed um, on insects in order to get the nitrogen that they, the nitrogen that they needed. Um, so you couldn't really facilitate it in a way that you would for a normal plant. Uh, as far as feeding them, however, um, I, I really don't know too much about that. Although I would say that maybe like a black soldier fly might be really nice because I know that at least as larvae, they have um, a pretty big calcium and protein and fat content, which makes them really great for like chickens. But uh, as an adult, I'm sure a lot of that has been um, uh, transformed into um, uh, sort of other structures. That was a great answer, man. Yeah. They, um, I got a buddy that does those. Um, he does a lot of pitcher plants and, and uh, Venus fly traps. And they're there. You can create like he creates like bogs. You can create like a bog terrarium. That's um, so cool. Yeah, I know. It's pretty dope, man. I wonder if you could like maybe strategically place some of these bog terrariums around, you know, your facility. You know, maybe just that's kind of novelty. And also maybe it catches a few pests along the way. You know what I mean? Something maybe like put them at entrances that's that's what right. occurs to me i like the well and if i were to choose of these three if you were to be like which one matt sundew venus i tried pitcher plant we're gonna we're gonna do some research and see which one could be a good one i would go with the pitcher plant if i had to guess mm -hmm. because i feel like they're like you said overfeeding them is important or it's important not to do this um, but of them i feel like maybe the sundew also has like a way to like limit that because it can only feed on what it like put brings back in but i feel like the pitcher plant would have the highest carrying capacity like for like flies or whatever and it seemed like the pitcher plant would allow the praying mantis to kind of sit there and swipe bugs and, and just sit up there comfortably where the or a jumping do, spider yeah exactly but where the sundew would catch you know the, the praying mantis would get an arm stuck on there and then it would eventually die or uh, a jumping mm. spider gets on a sundew because for you guys that don't know uh, a sundew plant is basically like a sticky trap nature's sticky trap uh, but it is so effective and like you had mentioned it, it does seem like it has some kind of a, attraction to it maybe like a, a sweetness or something because it attracted a, a lot of beneficials uh, and then it would just stick um if that was the other thing too it didn't seem like the the sundew was as strong uh potentially so like sometimes the the praying mantis could break away or other mm. times it seemed like it wasn't able to um, mm. so maybe the overall health of the the sundew itself like i always wondered those kind of things like is this plant not really strong enough to take down this ridiculously sized uh prey i guess you know because yeah, some of the mantis like are right. bigger than the sundew themselves yeah. exactly oh yeah i feel yeah. like they're i feel like you're right like and there's also, you know, there's a lot of um, different species. Some of them are bigger than others, especially with the pitcher plants. Um, I used to follow somebody on Instagram who I think, I want to say it was like Nephanta something or other. I think it was actually like a family or a genus of a plant, but they had a ton of carnivorous plants and various pitcher plants and things like this. And like you're saying, and I think they're kind of, some of these plants are just way too fragile for uh, some of the bigger insects out there. Yeah, shout out to my buddy Rusty Shackelford. Uh, he's uh, he's the one that does the uh, all the pitcher plants. And some of these pitcher plants hold like a quart of water. Like a, I mean, they're big. Like pitcher plants can be really huge. There's some small versions too. Um, but I thought that was pretty neat. 
It seems there. like it's is water, and then there's like bile, for lack of my understanding of it. it. It looks like there's some kind of like liquid that the plant starts to make as it gets healthier and healthier. There's like a. I know that they rely on some like you know a lot of like enzymes and things to break it all down um, when they come into the the liquid. They do. They do rely on rain to help fill them up, though, and then the, the enzymes are probably mixed in with that. It's like their stomach. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, I do like remember reading it. about yeah. uh, a pitcher plant that um, utilized uh, rats. It uh, attracted, I want to say it was mice or rats, to actually uh, urinate or defecate into the pitcher plant. And it would get its nutritionist sources that way, which is pretty bizarre. But uh, I guess useful. <laughs> yeah. the, the intelligent insects seem to know that, like, hey, I just don't get on the inside of the pitcher plant. I don't have any issues. Where, you know, the, the obviously, like, some of the, the dumber flying insects and stuff, they just kind of fly into it. Um, what is on the inside of that? Do you, do you happen to know if that, what creates that to be so slippery uh, if it is just water and yeah, that's a good question. I think that there's like a mucus. I don't know for sure, but I think there's like, I think that a lot of pitcher plants that attract like flies, for example, or other insects, they have like a sweet substance. I don't know if it's always in the liquid or if it's always in the, the um, kind of like the interior, but whatever it is, um, they are attracted to it. They, you know, get close and close. You know, they start at the rim and then they go deeper and deeper and then they slip. And a lot of insects can actually do very well at like grabbing onto like walls as many people know, you know, they can climb a vertical surface or fly. Um, but uh, I think there's like a mucus or something that limits that ability. And sometimes, you know, they get a couple of chances, right? Depending on how deft they are at flying, uh, they might like slip, fly, hover, and then, you know, evacuate, or they will slip and tumble into the liquid and um, I think the surface tension also plays a role in like trapping them, but I'm not sure at the top of my head. Yeah, one of the things that um, that helps that, uh, Brian, is the way the, the walls of the pitcher plant, are, the cells are aligned. They have these defensive, they're trichomes, but they're not like trichomes as you know, we know, I think they're called defensive trichomes. And they all just angle down. So down, oh. down, down into the plant, all in the same direction. So when the animal or the insect it makes it slippery, so now it can't really get back up. And so that's part of it. That would make a lot of sense because, um, you know, it's like, yeah, like, like I could have totally imagine like rows of just like downward facing trichomes like this. Mm -hmm. And like, if you, if you, you know, you grab onto it, but it just, it just slips mm -hmm. off. Like there's no, there's no purchase for the tarsus. That makes a lot of sense. That's cool. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Like under a scope, the way it's kind of scaled, like fish scales in a way. And they're very effective for you guys out there that have never tried it or anything. Um, maybe 20 bucks uh, for a little one, 50 bucks for a big one. Uh, and then you can kind of uh, build that out and then clone those as well. So again, you know, pennies on the dollar uh, with some of these skill sets. Uh, and then you'll be surprised to see how effective these things are, especially if you are running like jumping spiders and then have a few of these pitcher plants out. Uh, peek into that every week or so and you'll see that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the pitcher plant has taken up. That's why I was, you know, asked you, Matthew, if it, if it's even necessary to to add things, because every now and then I'll find like slugs or something, and I'll just throw them in the pitcher plant, uh, and I would imagine that it help, or I hope that it kind of boosts things up. And it does seem like mm -hmm. they they also enjoy uh, just being sprayed with water and, and maybe a little bit of protein. Uh, again, I'm just experimenting. I don't really, I don't really know. So, uh, what do you think some of the nutrients it might be lacking? Uh, to, to help build that up because I like um, and the reason why I guess I'm, we're kind of spending some time on this is you know you can spend money on these sticky traps and that kind of stuff but for a lot of us out there we know that's more just symptom treating uh, you're just going to know that you have a, a problem where at the same time you can have a pitcher plant um, continue to battle things and you will notice like if you have a fungus gnat outbreak there will be a ton of fungus gnats in that pitcher plant so it's just another way to use that canary in the coal mine uh, but you're using mother nature instead of buying the blue and the yellow sticky traps i like that um i think it'd be really cool i don't even know if there's even a species that would be suitable for what i'm about to say um but if you had like this like 
you know, victory bell sized pitcher plant. That's just, you know, like large, like a, just a big pitcher plant um, that you could like install at like every corner of your building if it's inside or like maybe at the entrances of your farm or something like this or around where your cultivation rows are, however you're growing. That would be really cool. And like you say, you could just, um, you could take like a, 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 like a mesh, you know, sort of like a funnel or something and you could just dip it in and, uh, and just take, and like, you know, you could, you could take them out and like, look at what they are if they're not too digested and then you could put them right back. And maybe that would introduce some sort of a contaminant potentially, but maybe not. And uh, like you say, that would be kind of a cool uh, low tech, like living system that you could, you could substitute for, um, you know, the yellow sticky cars that are really popular. And um, oftentimes they're very attractive to even things you don't want to kill. Um, whereas for example, with the um, pitcher plants, they might go after things, they might kill things or things might be attracted to them that you don't want, but much more or less likely it's going to be a predator than it's going to be like something that's looking for like a sugary substance or something like that, if that makes sense. So in that way, it's kind of nice. Yeah, it makes sense because a jumping spider most likely won't go into a pitcher plant because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be attractive to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And these pitch, I'm going to have to reach out to get me some pitcher plants and mess with I like this idea. Uh, and then the last one, like you had mentioned, Matthew, the, the Venus flytraps, my experience with those things is that it ends up being a kind of a wasted uh, amount of money, especially if you kind of go uh, large on it in a larger scale operation. Uh, the humidity just isn't there. You're obviously not going to get the humidity where it needs to be over your cannabis plants. Um, you know, th that's kind of my experience. It seems like they, they're not as effective. It's almost a cool little thing to put in your bathroom and that, that will live. Uh, at least here in Denver, uh, but for the for the most part, uh, you're not really going to be able to use that to be effective, other than kind of just a, a cool thing to look at, if you will. I had some. It's, by no means is this like small sample size experience going to be relevant to everyone or every species, but I have to agree uh, with Venus flytraps. Uh, I used to have like one or two, and uh, I enjoyed like you know, having them and, 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 and feeding them and that sort of a thing. But um, I did feel like, cause the thing is, is that if an insect, there, there are definitely cases where like an insect or some other arthropod will like travel along the, the mouth of the Venus flytrap, trigger the response, have it envelop them, but uh, it's just a little bit too big or whatever. And that will just cause the, um, the head will just uh, decay it'll exude the enzymes and break down the organism, but then it will like kind of not be a good seal. It'll rot. And then it'll cause the rest of the, the, the head, the leaf head, because these are like modified leaves to like travel down into the core of the, the, the Venus flytrap. And that can cause problems too. So in that way, I feel like they are uh, vulnerable in a way that a pitcher plant sort of, you know, mechanically isn't. Yes, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> yeah, I feel like those Venus flag traps, they're kind of in between, like, you know, like in football, there's a term called your tweener. They're like between two positions. It's like they're kind of small, so they make it, they catch flies. But then again, in our in our grows, you know, how much problem is a fly? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of look at what they could potentially catch. I wish they were like microscopic and they can catch like fungus gnats and you can do like a tray of microgreen fly traps, <laughs> you know, then you could get some action. But I think the size probably isn't great for, for you know, like you said, Brian, might be a waste of money. Maybe you could, um, on that matter, for any of these carnivorous plants, you could forego the, the sticky card, but you could still have something yellow or maybe UV reflective and attract them by like having like having a background that's like, you know, bright yellow or, or UV kind of light or something. You could install that near the plant and have a bunch of flies and other, um, you know, pest organisms maybe become attracted to that. That could be something maybe that would be sort of interesting. So you're not, cause it's not sticky, right? So 
uh, you might attract things that you might not like. First, you don't have to replace it, but also uh, you'll attract a, a greater amount of things. But at the same time, like we were saying earlier, you might attract something that you don't want to. Yeah, true. And for all of you out there that have ever messed with sticky traps, you know, if you're using any uh, volume with that, that's just going to get on your hands. I mean, it's just it's kind of a nightmare to work with uh, at, a, at a larger level. So if you can kind of figure things out using, again, Mother Nature to combat certain things, being proactive, uh, using predatory mites, I feel like is another thing that is extremely beneficial in the soil as well as on the leaf matter. Uh, this is just something else I feel like that you can take it to the next level and how uh, Matthew mentioned, having them at uh, exits and enter, enter in ways and, and that kind of stuff, I feel like it's, uh, kind of next level if you will because that way you can kind of continue to monitor things and as you walk in uh the plant that pitcher plant for the most part will take care of itself um all it needs is really a, a little bit of misting every now and then uh if you're in a drier environment like we are here yeah one thing about sticky traps man there's nothing worse than like getting a beneficial on a sticky trap you know like yeah. i told this <laughs> i told this story before i had a rove beetle on a sticky trap and i was able i, I said damn you doing so he's on his back so it's like one wing was stuck on the sticky trap so i took a probably this pen something like this and i kind of flipped him off and got him onto the tip of the pencil and i kind of like put him back in the soil and he was able to fold one wing back and the other wing kind of stayed half half out wouldn't fold back and uh so i just left you know went on about my business and looking in the soil like two days later i noticed the same rove beetle with the busted up wing was just going about his business still in the soil you know what i mean so you know just once you get into living soil man all those little things they, they you really really pay attention to them and they they i mean they kind of become you know it's like your family like it's just like a soil family all those things you know they're working for you so they you know they're beneficial so you start to really respect them and, and look for them you know? uh, that's a beautiful sentiment i would definitely encourage more people to have that uh approach to, to insects and i'm of course biased when i say that i'm the bug guy but you know they're very important over 90 percent of animals are insects um or even more even a greater proportion arthropods so they are very important. And um, like you kind of say, like I, I used to work with a ornamental grower and they would apply the yellow sticky cards out because they would get thrips a lot. And uh, that was part of their integrated pest management plan. It certainly it helped them out, but I would see uh, egregious numbers of some of the beneficials they're applying like the uh, diglyphus wasps that they would apply for leaf miner or um, lady beetles like we said even like silabora uh lady beetles which feed on powdery mildew you know so like and they were dealing with a powdery mildew problem um and also even like birds like there were people who are the of being the, these are like large like bands of sticky yellow sticky um material and um you know like you would there are people who had like cut bird carcasses off because of that and i think that's Mm. uh egregious and unfortunate yeah yeah that's that's just we that's what i'm called for that's, um hey so um can we get into i'm just looking at some of my questions from folks um root aphids oh now, yes I pulling, yeah i was pulling weeds out here man and um just observing shit and i noticed green aphids on this weed you know on the roots it was pretty cool and then i also noticed when i looked back at the soil there was ants down there and I know a lot of people know that, um, you know, ants and aphids somewhat go together. Um, the, for me, I have a little, I'm not mad at aphids as long as they're not on my plants. Like you talked earlier about um, uh, banker plants. And I have some plants that literally like um, daikon radish can grow right next to cannabis. They'd be right on the daikons and not on the cannabis. I know it sounds crazy, but I let them ride. Um, Give us Not a crazy. On, yeah, give us a little bit on, on aphids and, and root aphids and all that good stuff. Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to start off by just setting the context. Um, aphids have been around since before we had flowering plants. So they've been around a long time. And they used to feed on coniferous, you know, like trees and things like that way before the first flowering plants. But when those flowering plants occurred, 
when they first developed and we had sort of the flowering plant explosion, uh, aphids sort of rapidly kind of um, followed the diversica diversification of flowering plants. So their success has been aphid success, basically. Um, and I bring this up because there's two kinds of main aphids that people have to worry about in general. There's aphids that are specialized on like two different groups of plants that are oftentimes like disparately related. So you have like a summer host and you have like a winter host or an autumn host. Um, and they'll switch between one or the other, spring and autumn, I should say. Uh, and then there's other ones that don't do this. They do not have this behavior. They just stay on the same plant, um, you know, sort of continually. Rice root aphids um, are the first kind. They will move from sort of a spring host to a um, to a fall host. And for the fall host, they're like a woody sort of plant. So like um, typically rice root aphids are familiar or um, they're associated with uh, like um, prunus species and a uh, rowan and things like this. But in the spring, they'll feed on like grasses. Uh, like barley and, and 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 of course rice, right? And uh, other sorts of other sorts of plants like that. And I often come across people who don't know this, of course, and they're curious why they have rice root aphids because they control them so well, uh, like in their cultivation space. But they don't ever look outside of their cultivation space. But still on their property, there's rice root aphids feeding on, you know, uh, a nectarine plant or feeding on a barley, just wild feral barley in the soil, you know, it just like kind of cropping up. Um, I had a client, I had two clients at this point, uh, three actually at this point uh, in like the LA County area where they had an indoor cultivation facility. Uh, and they had of course, kind of like a almost, you know, like a very sparse, like urban asphalt ridden location. But they still had, these uh, barley plants sticking up out of the ground and the rice root if it's right on there. So it's very important for people to sort of evaluate their local environment and their local area and learn what are the potential hosts of these pests that they're dealing with and see if they have them on their area. Cause they might actually do. If they do, they have to make the decision about whether they cull that plant um, population that's nearby. Uh, sometimes that's what you have to do. Uh, and other times you can facilitate, you can do that and then facilitate other plants that would compete or that they would, uh, you know, especially if they're native, right? Because not all of these plants that they find in their property are native to the local environment. So they could po perhaps even get rid of those exotic uh, plants that are host to this exotic insect and then supplement with uh, or supplant with um, sort of native plants that are not going to be great hosts for them which I'm a big advocate for. Uh, so that way you're sort of restoring the local ecology that you're growing on and you're also uh, forestalling the rice root aphid or some other aphid from getting on there. In cannabis, we have the cannabis aphid forward on cannabis and the rice root aphid ropalosiphum rufi abdominale. And, uh, you know, if you don't want to get a degree in Latin, that's fine. But I do want to say that sometimes the names matter the uh, rufi in rufi abdominale or abdomen, right, uh, stands for red. And rice root aphids, if you've never seen them, they can be a few different colors. I've certainly come across some that are jet black. They're sort of a greenish color, a yellowish color, but they often have um, a sort of reddish abdomen at the end. And that's some that's a really great you know way to tell what you're dealing with. And of course, them being in the in the in the soil on the roots is course an indicator um what else do i want to say about them i have a pest primer video i have a series of videos called pest primer so it's hashtag pest primer all one word and um i did a video on rice root aphid i have several videos on the rice root aphid uh, with information on how to treat them um on how to sort of identify them visually how you can take a look at them and see what you're dealing with um, some of them are biocontrol agents like microbes some of them are chemical agents that are botanical insecticides as well. So there's a sort of a bevy of different things that you can use. There we go. Does that red color correlate with like the um, rhizobacteria that you would, you know, if you have cut open like a legume nodule, it'll be red 
from that bacteria? Is that correlating there or just coincidence? You know, it's funny you say that. Aphids are, um, they're very well known because they have a, like, they have several microbial symbionts in them, mainly bacteria, uh, like um, uh, Serratia is one of them, and uh, Buchnera is the other one that's really common. And they actually synthesize the amino acids that aphids need to survive. See, aphids feed mainly on phloem sap. Um, most of the things that they're getting is like the, the sugars in the plant, but also some trace minerals and also some amino acids that are freely moving around when the plant's transporting, um, you know, uh, various things from one part of tissue to another. So, um, maybe there is something to be said of the bacteria. I know that certain bacteria do have an effect on other aphid species color. So like the P aphid is, can, there's a green phenotype and there's a red phenotype and the red phenotype, the, we used to think that it was caused by maybe like genes or whatever, but it's, it's anthocyanin. Um, but it's actually, or, or maybe that was what they thought, but actually I think it was the bacteria the presence or absence of certain bacteria caused uh, the change in color, which is pretty amazing. So maybe that's the case here. I don't know. Um, yeah. I think we have and, a, uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. We had a question come in, but you can finish your thought. Sorry about that. Well, I think it's the question I was going to ask, which I see that from Chad here, uh, some people are saying that uh, rice root aphids have wings or, or something to that effect. And, and it's true. So um, aphids often, so they reproduce, uh, a lot of times asexually, almost exclusively in some cases. And the rice root aphids native to East Asia. And I think particularly some people will say Japan, but I don't, you know, it's kind of hard to, to tell sometimes. Um, in their native range, they are, they, I think that a sexual um, population is more common, but outside of their native range, there seem to be populations that are not that way. But regardless, aphids are born pregnant. Actually, they're born pregnant twice. Uh, they're already grandmothers before, uh, you know, once they reach adulthood, because the em because the embryos that they have in their body are themselves pregnant. So mm -hmm. they're very good at reproducing. And in order for them to get to different hosts, like other insects, they do have wings, but they don't make their winged forms unless certain um, environmental stimuli occur. Part of that's like light. Part of that is, um, that's a great example here. Because uh, you see they have, to, the wings and the flying is um, very energy intensive and, and they have to have the right muscles and everything for this all work out well. So oftentimes what happens is that the aphids will be feeding in the ground and the, uh, the plant host is gonna senesce eventually. And they can actually taste the difference in the plant when the plant is, um, for example, you know, if we fertilize it, if we give a certain nutrient content, that nutrient content changes. Um, you know, if the sugar content in the plant is higher or lower in, you know, different kinds of tissues, they might move around to accommodate that. Like I want more sugar, so I'm going to go to a, a larger vein or, you know, maybe you want to dilute that with a little bit of xylem liquid and you sort of, move around and insert your cell into the xylem channel, but whatever, eventually the nutrition, the nutritional physiology changes, the um, plant starts to senesce and the aphids say, well, it's time for me to make the winged forms. And so they do. And those winged forms move to the other plants um, in order to sort of create the eggs for the next generation. And then they overwinter. And um, I have seen rice root aphids uh, lay eggs, and I've also seen um, cannabis aphids lay eggs to overwinter, but um, you might not always encounter that, so it really depends on your environment, and sometimes you just don't see it happen for various reasons, so it's a little bit capricious. All right, I feel like aphids is a good place to um, kind of like start tying in the soil food web, I think, with those root aphids, like I always, I'm always really confident in my soils and knock on wood, I haven't had, I don't have a lot of pest pressure and I haven't had since I've been doing, you know, natural farming and living soils. Um, 
obviously I think we all know that the importance of, you know, the strong, the strength of your soil biology and plant uh, health all, all go together. Um, what, what are some of the things that actually, you know, what, what makes a plant successful, uh, susceptible to being attacked? Like, what do you think, you know, make it makes a certain plant weak or, or kind of, you know, open to, to being diseased? Yeah, so plant health is a super complex topic. Uh, I just wrote my winter issue article for Skunk Magazine um, uh, specifically on this topic. What is plant health? What is it? Is it genetic resistance? Is it nutrition? You know, is it one or the other? Is it both? Is it presence, absence of pests? You know, it's really all of those things. So I like to talk about things from like a molecular genetic level, which is admittedly, you know, really specific, um, but it helps to illustrate how these relationships, these symbioses have, have developed over, you know, millions of years. And um, so let me just give you an example. So like aphids, when they feed on a plant, uh, aphids have to first find the plant visually through olfaction and then they also uh, have gustatory cues and i have a video on my youtube channel that's called um how aphids feed on healthy plants um and so they they use gustatory cues when they feed on the plant they also use olfactory cues when they're flying around searching and so usually a combination of visual stimulus and olfaction allows them to land on the plant then they feed on the plant and that plant will have a sugar content. It will have maybe even certain toxins, right? And in some cases, if, an, if the aphid does not specialize on that plant, then it only needs to get, you know, a mouthful of like, you know, some sort of natural toxic compound or protein or something. And it's like, nah, this is not the right plant. Let me go somewhere else. So, so they do taste tests. They do penetration tests and... Uh, you know, they, they it either works or it doesn't. It's either suitable or it isn't. In a case for like cannabis, for example, or rice root aphids, uh, they are adapted to feed on the cannabis plant and other various plants. So they have a very um, broad range sort of genome that allows them to detoxify and suppress the immune systems of many different plants. So when an aphid feeds on a plant, uh, they're not like super, they're not totally vulnerable. For one, a lot of aphids vector viruses. Now, we don't know for sure if cannabis aphid or rice root aphid feeds or uh, vectors viruses for cannabis, or at least I'm not aware of it. And, if, and you know, I'm going to say that here, and then two years, four years, five years, 10 years, perhaps this is shown to be the case. We do know that rice root aphid and cannabis aphid, or either rice root aphid rather, does vector viruses in other plants. So it's not like populations are devoid of them, but we don't really know the answer to that. What we do know is that um, when they do feed on the plant, they have to suppress the immune system of the plant. And they do a lot of way, they do a lot of things in order to do that. They stick their silet in, they produce uh, a saliva that has these things called effectors. And basically what happens is that these effectors get into the cells and they get into the phloem of the plant and um, they essentially neutralize um, toxins and they neutralize um, sort of like hormonal response triggers so that the plant um, has a delayed or in some way incomplete immune response to the aphid feeding and the more that that happens the more especially at a local level that that's useful for the, the aphids. So the aphids feeding, uh, it's already born pregnant, remember? So it's able to produce a bunch of its clonal offspring. They in turn feed on the plant locally. Uh, they add their own suppression effect to the plant locally. And so that sort of builds and builds and builds. And they're able to, um, you know, in pretty short order, feed and reproduce on the plant really well. Um, also, for that matter, I just wanted to, to point out that um, I do hear it a lot that people say that the sugar content in the plant or the bricks level, which aren't exactly the same thing, right? But uh, the sugar content in particular can be insecticidal to aphids. But 
Um, in that video I mentioned uh, about how aphids can feed on healthy plants, they uh, have been shown in experiments that they're able to feed on uh, bricks levels of 34%, which is really egregiously high. Um, sugar actually makes them feed more uh, rather than less. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, when a lot of people out there hear stuff, especially from certain individuals, um, they just kind of as an echo chamber. Sometimes their things aren't questioned. Uh, so what you're kind of bringing up is some of the John Kemp's work. Uh, so some of the things that he's his camp is saying and, and that maybe that ideology is saying you don't necessarily agree with. So I was hoping that we could kind of uh, give you the, the voice, the, the platform here for you to kind of explain uh, hopefully, also uh, Matthew, for the layman, on why why you don't believe the uh, some of the things that are claimed. So it's not necessarily even me. Um, people shouldn't just take my word for it. And in the in the video, I cite resources for people who are way more qualified than I am to speak on the subject. Uh, um, and uh, Dr. Angela Douglas. Uh, her research in particular, she's insect physiologist and toxicologist. And um, she has uh, looked into this sort of relationship, especially with aphids, but also other insects. And uh, her research is the focal point um, of, of this video um, and of the resources that I draw from. But basically it's because um, for many decades, actually, um, we have looked into how it is and why it is that herbivorous insects feed on plants and what can be done about that? And the reason why it doesn't make sense to me that that would be the case is because of this research that shows that the aphids are not, um, they don't seem to be phased by even massively large amounts of sugar. And um, that's why the claim, the specific claim that the sugar content in plant tissues uh, can be at a certain level and make the plants resistant or immune uh, sort of specifically because of the sugar uh, doesn't make sense to me. But what would make sense to me, and the reason why I think bricks levels are still very important, um, is because they couldn't not be important, man. It's the photosynthate of the plant. It's literally what the photosynthetic process is all about, is making those sugars uh, to power various physiological processes. So in a way, sugar content tells you that the photosynthesis is active and it's happening, and you're you're um, assimilating a lot of sugars. Now those sugars go on to fuel primary metabolism, but also secondary metabolism, like the production of toxins and um, proteins and uh, you know hormone response triggers and other sorts of things that are really important for plant growth and development. So in that way, they're still very important, but um, these insects have adapted to feed on the sugars and they definitely have, um, and so I don't, understand when people say that the insects don't have like enzymes to break down sugars or anything like this, because they absolutely do. Um, you know, I had erroneously mentioned spider mites a little while ago when I was talking about jumping spiders. Spider mites have a massive genome that's specifically articulated to detoxification of, pro of um, enzymes and toxins in their plants. That's why they can feed on so many different kinds of plants, over 1,200 documented species of plants that we care about. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that's the main thing is that aphids have absolutely been shown to have the various enzymes to break down sucrose with like sucrase and um, glucosidases and, um, you know, breaking down like oligosaccharides and things. And in tests, we see that even with these high sugar uh, diets, like 34% bricks, which is egregious, um, you know, the osmotic pressure in their bodies stay the same. Uh, they're able to reduce the osmotic pressure of the sugar concentrate that they're getting um, from like, in some cases, something like four megapascals, which is massive. Um, that's like the pressure of like um, the proportional pressure, right? This is happening at a small scale, but it's the proportional pressure of like, uh, um, like a, like a CO2 canister for like a um, paintball marker, for example, like that's a lot of force. Uh, and they're able to, through enzymatic action, uh, basically turn that sugar osmotic pressure down into their own sort of stable homeostasis of like one or so megapascals. 
uh, and you can tell it too because the, there's um, they can take they can take a look at the sugar, uh, they can like uh, irradiate the sugar or or treat the sugar in such a way that it responds to like um, like a, a marker or like a, a radiation test. The sugar goes into the the, in, the insect and breaks down, and then they can even see where all of those sh- molecules that they digest go to. Some of them go to like the amino acid, free amino acids in the plant, right? Um, you know, some of those go to uh, obviously proteins that go that the aphid produces or that makes for its own body. A lot of it goes to it gets broken down and is excreted. The sugars, I, I mean, as a honeydew, and uh, they get processed. So, so even though they don't always di- they don't always um, sequester all of the sugar that they feed on that they extract or rather that they like let into their body since it's such a massive pressure that they're not even sucking it up. That's why sap sucker is kind of a misnomer. Um, I don't really care. I'm not that pedantic, but uh, they actually are really more like a, um, a tap. They're the, the, the hydrostatic pressure from the plant is shunting the liquid into their body. And so they enzymatically break down as much as they can. And the rest of it that still gets broken down uh, that's still sugary, but just it's not sucrose anymore. It's like glucose. Um, uh, it's accrued as honeydew. And and um, that becomes a substrate for sooty molds. That becomes a, uh, a important food source for ants, for example. And uh, ants will go to great lengths to, um, to, to protect, in some cases, aphids uh, because of that honeydew secretion. And although I wouldn't say that it's relevant here for IPM of like cannabis, uh, it's also very important to say that um, in some ecological contexts, it's actually a benefit for the plant. See, the sugar is kind of like a tax. And if the aphid feeds on the sugars of the phloem, you know, of course that's a detriment to the plant. But it's kind of like the microbiome where a lot of these sugars go into the soil and power the soil microbiome um, you know, through the exudates, the aphid is feeding on the sugar produces honeydew ants come in and harass or kill other insects that would be more damaging. So although it's a cost, all symbioses are costly. They have some sort of a cost attributed to them. It's, it's not a free lunch scenario, but what ends up happening is that the ant army, the guard recruitment, uh, is actually a net benefit for the plant instead of being bulldozed by, uh, some mammal or something, the ants come in and attack. And so then the plant survives, but it might not have already. Um, but that's more like in like rainforests and things like that. But it just speaks to the, um, I think the the variety of interactions between herbivorous insects and their hosts. Now, until you went against the grain on this, I felt like no one ever disagreed with uh high bricks would ward off and potentially deter um you know sap sucking insects uh, so why do you think that became gospel i feel like and and what it seemed like for many many years myself included uh when i would try to reach out to people uh at that time we were going around to a lot of the cannabis expos listening to a variety of people talk on subjects being able to ask questions about bricks Yes, yes, yes. Everybody echoes the same thing. Higher bricks, um, you know, it's not going to, you know, eventually that's the goal, right, is to be, uh, at least with the living soil system, especially at that time, was to be a high end of bricks levels to where the IPM was managed and then water only kind of thing. Uh, and for a lot of us, that seemed almost too good to be true. Uh, and then I feel like here you are kind of, you know, saying that that isn't true. So where do you think, is there anywhere where you've seen certain people have claimed and have anything to back that up? Um, or is it just kind of like been passed down that this is, this is how things work and no one really checked that. I don't have a, I don't think I have a good, um, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I think that, I think that it is somewhat of an exploitation of people's admittedly understandable lack of understanding of like, you know, plant physiology or insect physiology. Um, I don't want to say that it's like uh, basic knowledge because it absolutely is not right. Um, But a lot of people just aren't aware of 
these sort of like niche, uh, very small interactions. That's why, like I said, I love to talk about these like molecular level interactions because that's where the bread and butter of all these interactions are happening, even though they're complex and even though they're hard to account for in the macro sphere when you're working as a cultivator. But if you know that that's what's happening, then you um, kind of, you, you sort of safeguard yourself from marketing claims that might say otherwise. As for why people are saying it, even though there's research that counteracts it, um, I'm not totally sure. I'm reticent to even make like a hypothesis about how like perhaps there's like a, um, I, I guess there there is a movement of folks who maybe feel that like, I think it's kind of similar to like pH, for example, or like uh, oxidation or um, uh, or I should say like reactive oxygen species, for example, or redox reactions in general. Um, like plants use them, microbes use them, insects use them. Um, all of these life forms are using enzymes and toxins and signal compounds and um, all these pathways in order to interact. And from an ecological standpoint, there's really very, there's no reason to even approach that perspective that maybe, um, you know, somehow all you need is like a high sugar content um, because it would seem like that would be a selection pressure for one to, you know, if that were the case, then something would adapt to it. If they've adapted to toxins, why would they not adapt to sugars? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that it is just generally a misunderstanding of, um, the capabilities of these really cool life forms because the main gospel was that the the insects weren't able to break down these sugars uh, that was the main thing that i felt like other people would be like well yeah that's that's why that that it, you know is achieved uh, but at the same time like when you're when you're constantly growing plants it does seem like yes that the plant is healthier there's certain ways and um, there's even certain genetics that can ward off potential things but at the same time uh, I feel like w when you're farming, you almost have to assume that there's always something there and, and continuing to be proactive um, because there's really, but the potential is that something brutal could always come through. Uh, Mark, if you wanted to keep talking on this topic, otherwise I wanted to do yeah. I want. Yeah. I got a couple of things. Cool. So um, going back to the um, microscopic level, um, so one of my things, that one thing I practice is foliar feeds, especially, you know, veg and just the earliest part of flower um, and one of the one one of the ones I I use the most is FAA and it's in the way I learned in my experience is that when I use FAA fish amino acid it has a certain amount of oil it also has a lot of microbiology um, because it's made with IMO now if we zoom into the to the microscopic level when I spray that leaf surface with FAA now is that definitely um, going to deter, say, an aphid from wanting to, you know, go ahead and jab in and take a, take a sip of that? Or, or what do you, what's your experience with that? Have you read anything? I don't have a whole lot of experience with that, but I will say that um, not all interactions, and actually one of the things I really like about the regenerative ag and living soil uh, movement is this is, it's, in a lot of cases, it's this acknowledgement that, um, uh, you can use substances um, that are maybe not always commercially viable to produce, or you can take advantage and exploit uh, sort of natural physiological vulnerabilities, like with the pest, for example. So it does. I, I don't actually know for this specific example, but if it's been your experiential um, experience, I, su I suppose, um, you know, I wouldn't say that necessarily is wrong, and it could be like the oil itself being like a, a layer that is just, um, you know, repulsive, right? Because the insects, you know, if you keep them from even getting to the plant in the first place, like you've won, right? Like that, the, you have even left that, you have uh, not even left that chance, right? And I can see how a substance that you apply foliarly, like a biocontrol agent, um, uh, Bouveria bassiana, many people know I love to talk about this fungus, um, you know, it's, it can be an endophyte in a lot of plants and you can also apply it in the foliage and you can also apply it to the root zone as a drench. So 
you can apply it in all of these different ways inside the plant, on the plant on the top, on the plant at the bottom. And you can create this sort of phyto rhizo microbiome barrier right, in that way and other biocontrol agents too. And even non biocontrol agents, like you say, like some sort of a substance like, like uh, fish amino acids or an oily substance or a saponin or something like this that, that has this sort of physical effect that uh, makes the plant repulsive uh, to the pest. Like that's way better than using like a directly toxic compound as far as I'm concerned. Um, not only does it, I mean, not only does it remove you from, you know, potentially harming other organisms through their ingestion of toxins, right? Because uh, you can also get situations with sublethal effects where they feed on the toxin, they don't get quite enough to kill them, the ones that are too sensitive die, the ones that are somewhat sensitive are already in the population, are selected for, and then now only those organisms reproduce. And so usually those traits then get um, magnified. Strong. Yeah. Okay. Very good. That makes a lot of sense. Did you want to um, go into a different direction, bro? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, a lot of people were reaching out to pick his brain, um, obviously, about the the elusive russet mite. Uh, yes. Ways to, especially being potentially proactive with certain things that are effective and, again, things that aren't going to uh, waste their time, that kind of thing, or waste their money. Uh, things that you've seen um, and maybe some even some trivial ways that you've seen people have been able to um, – uh, maybe not pay attention and, and introduce russet mites because I feel like sometimes when a lot of people are going in and out of your greenhouse, uh, especially a lot of uh, trimmers that might be going from uh, facility fa to facility, uh, that seems to be an another way that a lot of people on the back end uh, kind of shoot themselves in the foot when it comes to russets. Oh, definitely. Um, I want to say again, I want to also set the context with russet mites too. Um, I have videos about them, but also... Um, basically, people should know two things going forward with russet mites. One is that the Areophyidae, the russet mite family, or actually no, it's higher than that. But uh, the 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 yeah, the russet mite family, they are also uh, typically specialists. Um, so I've heard people say that like, oh, you know, I have tomatoes and they get tomato russet mite, and then I got russet mite on my cannabis, so it must be the tomato russet mite. But that's not necessarily the case and likely is not the case um, because they tend to be very host specialized and the tomatoes are in the Solanaceae and cannabis is in Cannabaceae. So they are not even, they're not related in, very closely. Um, so that's one thing to note. The other thing is that russet mites um, are so small that they are very often, like you say, they often get onto fomites like clothing and, you know, people's, uh, uh, you know, if people are harvesting and growing very close to where they're smoking and they go out and hang out with their friends or they go to a, a, a grow shop or something, they could deposit those in places. And there, it's not unheard of or, or impossible for that sort of vectoring to occur. That's why uh, biosecurity is so important, especially for prevention. But also, rest of mice are so small that they will get carried up in the wind. Um, there is research that I've actually shared on my Instagram, but also on YouTube that basically goes over how people have, in some cases, uh, um, tracked russet mite movement. And the way that they did that is by putting pans of liquid on skyscrapers, and then the russet mites would just float onto the pans. I know it's crazy to hear this, but it's actually the case. They are so small that the fluid medium of air is a lot like the fluid medium of water. And um, they're just small enough to be able to use it in a, in a very different way. And of course, it requires them like to get quite a bit of a gust and then get up into the, like, you know, maybe not the jet stream, but pretty much very much in the air and then travel quite a distance away. Um, this is also true for other insects that are, that are very small, even aphids for that matter. Um, they oftentimes take advantage of their size um, and they are able to like fly up into a, a, into the air and then they get swept over by like a, a more powerful air current. And so that's another way that that can happen as well. So if people are, are mystified that they've done all they can do for biosecurity 
you know, they don't go to places, they always shower before they go into the field or into their grow space or whatever that might be. Um, and then they still get rusted mites and they're wondering why this is. And uh, this is part of the reason why they can literally travel in the air. Yeah, well, you think about it, man, how many millions of tons of dust blow from the Sahara Desert across the Atlantic and deposit in the, in the Amazon, you know what I mean? And so if dust can blow, then you know mites and microbes can also blow, blow and you're breathing them in pretty much every other breath. So, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like that's kind of why I love the FAA so much, because I I mean, I've all, you almost have to embrace that things are going to blow in. Like, it doesn't matter how many showers I took. You know, as soon as you open that door, a little bit of a little bit of air can just bring in some, some pests. So if you're staying on top of things like foliars, I feel like if that mic does blow in now, it doesn't really have a place to get a foothold. Whereas if you have a weak, you know, kind of open system, weak plants, maybe it's a little bit more of a foothold quicker than, than without. Oh yeah, um, I, mean, I mean that's that's the thing, right? Is that as a cultivator, you can exploit all these natural processes, um, you know, from other plants, but also, you know, yourself as well. Uh, you know, like commercial products, but also things you can make yourself. Microbes that you can collect yourself. Microbes that uh, I talked in a, another podcast kind of recently that I'm super excited about. And this is a bit of a a, um, a tangent, but. Um, you know, sort of synergizing like the technology and the technological uh, resources that we have, as well as the natural processes and ecology that we're familiar with and kind of blending those together in order to create a cultivated space that is um, it's going to facilitate those natural processes and optimize them um, for, for, for the cultivation of cannabis and other plants for that matter. So really, like you say, you're always going to be assaulted. There's always going to be new organisms or new pests, and you're always going to have herbivores and, and thrips and things that are around the area, even if you're doing everything right. Um, I was also talking about how people oftentimes don't take into account that different locations are going to be really beneficial or really detrimental. And right now, I think a lot of people, for good reason, are passionate to grow cannabis and especially like in the open environment, but a place that is, well, they might grow in a place that they, they don't have a lot of flexibility, right? Like they have to kind of grow where they are already. They're not gonna like move halfway across the continent in order to do it for just that reason. Some people do, but if you do that um, and you go to a location that's bad, then you're always going to be constantly dealing with that. And if you're in a location that has a lower pest pressure or for whatever idiosyncratic reason that this is the case, over time, multiple years, and as other people start to grow more and the infrastructure still isn't there to support cannabis like it is now that way, um, pests can sweep across um, the continent and the world and um, cause billions of dollars in damage. Uh, we see it in all kinds of crops all the time. And uh, I'm sorry to say that, but I feel like, I mean, that's one of the great benefits of, of um, the sort of the, the, the regenerative ag space, the living soil and soil microbiome research that we, that we like to consume and like to make use of because it's a low tech, the systems already work in ecology. It's just a question of optimizing it for cultivation. Well said, man. I like the way you said that kind of building that complete biome package, you know, kind of a big health bubble around your whole facility. You know, microbes can do it. They can be a big part of helping you with that for sure. Um, so yeah. I had a, well, I had a question then, um, since we're talking, um, I mean, are you still in russets? I was going to switch gears a little bit. Um, but one 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 person wanted to know a little bit more about: Is there a relationship between you know trichoderma and mycorrhizal fungi? Like, is that a, a direct relationship, or are they both kind of, you know, they're both kind of part of that uh, rhizosphere, and they kind of all both do their own thing? I actually have gotten that question a lot. Um, it seems like some people I don't actually know the context or anything, but it seems like maybe there are people who are saying one thing or another. Um, 
But like I always ask this question when people ask me this is what trichoderma do they mean? What mycorrhiza do they mean? Because um, you know, there's like trichodermas that are parasites, there are species that are parasitic of of uh, fungi kind of sort of almost indiscriminately and others that are more specialized. And I could totally fathom a situation where there's trichoderma and mycorrhiza working in synergy. Um, also, speaking to sort of capricious nature of the soil microbiome, I, I have to say in that, in that sort of sphere, um, you can have microbial species that like are known to be beneficial right that like are even in commercial products you know but they can have they don't always have the effect in the soil maybe they're in an environment that is you know just not conducive to them right so they don't they don't actually just because you incorporate the microbe doesn't mean that it's established right for example and then on top of that um the more we research microbiome interactions the more that we see that like it's not strictly that certain species are pathogens and certain species are beneficial. It's more so that even certain strains can be diametrically opposite to what people associate them with. Um, Fusarium solani, Fusarium oxysporum, for example, there those are species that are intensely pathogenic in a lot of cases, but there are strains of each one that have been shown to be endophytic and beneficial and, ben and even benign, you know? But then sometimes they move and become pathogenic under some circumstances like plant stress. In other cases, uh, they don't even do that. They just kind of continually are um, mutualistic with their plant host. So like, I want to, I don't want to say it's a crapshoot because it's definitely not, but it can be a little bit capricious and I think that speaks to the trichoderma mycorrhiza question you're talking about. Some cases it could be, some cases it might not be. And um, that's why I think it's really important for us to be able to identify and um, corroborate what we're seeing with what we're applying to make sure that the populations are in sync. And, um, you know, when we cultivate microbes, uh, you know, that we're doing our due diligence to keep the traits that we want and make sure that the cultures are viable and they're doing the things that we want. And those things that we want have a genetic basis oftentimes, but they also have to collaborate with other microbes in order to do that sometimes too. So you, it's like, you can't just single out one or another in a vacuum. You have to have a consortium that is um, going to facilitate each other. Yeah. I like a couple of things you said, man, you said, um, just because you add that microbiology to your soil doesn't mean it it will be established or even you know is even an environment for it to be established. Um, I think that's that's why it's so important to collect your IMO you know from a healthy forest you know from healthy soil because then you're collecting what's there you're collecting what's established. A lot of times you're buying things could be good could be bad um, as Matthew just explained, but you're paying for something. So you're paying for something. You're not really sure if it's even going to be established or beneficial in, in your system. So that's why it's kind of always important to start with your IMO. In my yeah, there are even some, um, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but there are even some cases of mycorrhizae uh, that are bad for the plant. Um, sometimes, like, you know, because they, they establish this, this mutualism or this symbiosis and then, or maybe the plant has like three or four different symbioses happening all at once. And sometimes, you know, the resources being gained from the ones that they're giving to the fungus are kind of like not helpful. Like it's almost like they're giving more than they're taking essentially. Like it's not a totally, uh, equi you know, uh, equitable relationship. And so plants even have mechanisms to attenuate that or to keep them from happening in the first place. So uh, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a basically uh, maybe a trail of probably questions we could go down on. 
Uh, Absolutely. What are some of the other like myths out there, common things that maybe some of us that, that don't have the academic background uh, and we again kind of just march in line and assume that it's correct. Uh, are there any certain things right off the top of your head that kind of stick out or some things that we could maybe deep dive with? Let me think. Well, okay, let's transition with a halfway point. Um, jumping off from the mycorrhiza, um, there is this uh, phenomenon called uh, mycorrhizal induced susceptibility. And I posted about it on Instagram before, but basically it's this, it's the, these sort of edge cases, or maybe it's a little unclear whether they're edge cases or not, but essentially from research, um, there are examples where um, the mycorrhizae are, the symbiosis is fine. You know, it, it, there's a nutritional, um, you know, uh, uptake and uh, downtake with the fungus, but the sort of hormonal response and the immune system response to regulating that symbiosis, making sure that the microbe, kind of like your gut microbiota, right? The gut microbes in your stomach, most of them are actually really great. They do good things for you, or they can be sort of benign, um, or they can be really detrimental if they kind of get out of control, right? So it's kind of the same kind of thing. If some of those microbes were to get into the wrong place in your body, even though they're typically great for you in your gut, uh, they can cause massive damage. And um, so your your immune system is not like too lackadaisical, right? It's still going to be like trying to keep things in order, essentially, because like, it's still a foreign body. So similarly, you can have situations where the mycorrhiza can have negative effects on the plant. And one of this is the virus-induced susceptibility. Sometimes mycorrhizae and other symbioses cause pathogens to become more prominent because the hormone or the immune response in the plant uh, um, just causes a priming in one direction that causes a deficiency in another. Um, and I guess I think that's one big... I guess that's the that's the big myth that I think a lot of people maybe should have dispelled is that uh, you shouldn't oversimplify these interactions as much as you can help it. Obviously, you have to simplify it somewhat, you know, and kind of target certain aspects of these uh, interactions that we consider to be detrimental for us. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess I've kind of lost my train of thought a little bit there, but I guess essentially I'm trying to say that mycorrhizae and um, other sorts of symbioses, basically the plant immune response is uh, complex and there's no free lunches and it's a, it's a sort of a, it's, it's a resource intensive interaction. So plant health is predicated on immune responses and immune responses are not magic. They are they are changes in the physiology essentially that happen. And even if it's mostly the same change from like one cultivar to another cultivar, like right with cannabis, they can have essentially the same response, but perhaps certain enzymes are produced more, certain proteins are produced more or uh, in different areas more, or, um, or maybe a slightly different enzyme is produced through some sort of mutation, right? And those small little changes over time add up into adaptations of resistance, for example, or susceptibility. Because just because you say the immune system is primed, well, what does that mean? Primed against what? And for how long? And how? Um, and, and people don't, like, I, I know that's very complicated biology, but I think it's really helpful I just feel like a lot of marketing kind of goes into that, right? They'll say it primes the immune system. And then somebody will say, well, great. I'll be fine for everything. The immune system's primed. What do I have to worry about? Um, but like there, for one thing, plants, when they prime their immune response, depending on how that happens, um, if you go further in one direction, you can't go in the other direction because there's physical changes happening in a cellular and molecular and genetic level. And other organisms will exploit other things that the system can't 
can't cover all of its bases about. And another factor is that growth is in a lot of cases detrimented by this priming. Not not all priming, right? But like if plants um if they receive a lot of like physical damage, for example, it can stimulate them to grow in a different way. This is fundamentally right how like topping works on plants, right? With the apical meristem. Um so like yeah, it's that makes sense. I don't want to like talk too much on that one topic. Muted, buddy. You muted, Marco. Uh, rookie mistake, my bad. Yeah, it makes sense, brother. Uh, thank you for that explanation. Um, HLV. <laughs> Every, yeah. I mean, that's kind of everyone's talking about that hop latent viroid. Um, I had a buddy of mine. I was just trying to get a little bit more info. Um, so give me, give us some lowdown on that. Cause I know it's a virus, right? I mean, it, it guess it started from hops plants or, I mean, kind of the root of it. And then how, I mean, it's how prevalent is it in the cannabis industry? Is it just getting, is it throwing the industry out of whack or is there ways to treat it? And what do you know about it? So hop latent viroid is a, it's a viroid. It's a kind of viral agent. And, um, Basically, it's like a circular strand of DNA, essentially, and uh, of RNA. Uh, did I say DNA? I meant to say RNA. But um, so you're right. It does come from hops. And for those who don't know, hops and cannabis are not just related. They're the most closely related genera of the cannabisi, or at least those two are most closely related to, the, to each other, I should say. So a long time ago, there was a plant that was an ancestor of both hops and cannabis, and it diverged 20 to 30 million years ago, depending on molecular clock estimations and fossils and, and, and other sorts of um, uh, markers that help sort of show us when and where that might have happened. So it's not totally uncalled for to, to expect that certain pathogens can be you know, to transmissible to their close relative, and hop latent viroid seems to be one of them. Now in hops, Hop latent viroid is also a massive problem. But what they've done is they essentially just, like they just grow cultivars that are resistant to it. They pretty much it is so bad that people can, in a lot of cases, only grow hops at a commercial level we're talking about here with nurseries and things that propagate these cultivars and um, produce varieties that are more resistant um, so through these processes, they've been able to make stock that is resistant to the hop latent viroid. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean the resistance is uh, totally going to confer immunity. But in a lot of cases, it is practically essentially that case. Cannabis doesn't have that. And so until we have the infrastructure and the research in order to support breeding programs that will do that, um, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to, to alleviate that problem. And of course, and I wrote about this in a different uh, a book for um, uh, horticultural or agriculture, organic farming is a book for organic farming by my, my peer, um, uh, Dr. Awasthi. He, uh, well, what I mentioned was that that was kind of the issue is that um, in, in hops, there was a very clear goal and they were able to um, alleviate that problem with breeding techniques. But with cannabis, there's no infrastructural support. A lot of people who grow cannabis are reticent to entrust their, you know, their genes, their, their cultivars that they've uh, produced um, with like a government or a regulatory body for a lot of obvious reasons. There's a lot of mistrust there. Um, you know, so so there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are going to make that difficult from a commercial level and also from a homesteading level. I mean, we're not even out of prohibition in a lot of ways, certainly not legislatively. And that's just going to complicate it further. So until that is possible, you know, hop latent viroid, I think will and I hate to say this, I think it will remain a very ugly blemish on what is otherwise, you know, a really really beneficial plant for us to cultivate and has been important for humans for like 10,000 plus years. Um, it's uh, unclear. I mean, it's mostly I should probably go into the, the aspects about it. What makes it latent viroid is that the symptoms are not always present 
or if they are present, they're kind of mild and not super unique. So you run into this problem where um, the uh, you can't tell if you necessarily have it, and things like stunting or a little bit of like intervenal chlorosis or you know weird um, you know developments. Like that could be hot latent viroid, it could be a phytoplasma, it could be a weird hormonal response that's just a genetic thing that's not viral in nature. You don't know. And you won't know unless you're able to test it in some capacity. Um, but it can spread mechanically. And in some research, it's shown that it can even spread vertically from parent to offspring, albeit at a low transmission rate. But even that, I think, is a little bit dubious. And I'd like to see more research into that uh, moving forward. Wow. So you're saying it. So if I grow uh, four plants sharing the same soil, they can strip that. That's how transmission can sp spread between different plants, just being in the same soil. Well, I would say it's more like um, like mechanical, like well, like like from like leaf touching, for example, or from like cutting, uh, cutting into the tissues and using the same equipment to cut into one tissue and then cutting into the other can definitely transmit it. And I, I'd probably say that through cutting. It's probably the, if I had to guess, it's probably the most um, common way that it is transmitted. I actually don't know uh, what the mechanical transmission rate is, but apparently that is also a way that it happens as well. It's a rough one. Very rough. We might have, you know, what with hemp russet mite, rice root aphid, uh, you know, lettuce, chlorosis virus, and beet curly top virus. You know, which are becoming a big issue, phytoplasmas, which are becoming a bigger issue, and then hop latent viroid. I would say that we're having our wine industry phylloxera moment, but it's way more diverse than that, unfortunately. But uh, the cannabis industry, or rather, not the industry itself, but the communal organization of many people over time have been able to weather the storm of prohibition and sort of, you know, the war on drugs. So I am, I feel like we can probably weather this too, honestly. I, I have I have optimism despite everything I've just said. Yeah, definitely. The one thing about um, cannabis, like you said, if they do find a way to uh, manipulate the RNA and kind of eliminate it, then people will, won't, you know, how do you trust your cultivar with combining different you know, RNAs and things like that? So I think it's gonna be challenging, like you said, um, is sharing of cuts, does that have a lot to do with it? I call it whoring. Like you got, everybody's got the same cut. You know what I mean? Is that mm. <laughs> part of it? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, the sharing of cuts is a massive biosecurity threat, I guess. And a lot of people don't do their due diligence, can't do their due diligence, not for lack of trying, but they just literally cannot. Like, uh, you know, if somebody were to ask me, what should I do? I would say, well, ideally, uh, could you maybe quarantine them? You know, could you maybe like put them in a different location for a little while so you can look at them, see, scope them a little bit, uh, do some scouting, uh, maybe even treat them separately from your other plants. But again, hop latent viroid defeats that because, you, you know, usually I would ask people to do it for like, for like insects and mites and things like that or fungi like a week possibly two weeks but latent viroid could be way longer than that and you you wouldn't know so uh, you know it's kind of an unreasonable ask for a lot of people from a home growing perspective and even from a commercial perspective too like what are they supposed to like stop operations for months you know like how is that going to be viable at a business level are they te yeah. are they um sending out for testing then matthew so say like if you um suspect it suspect suspect you got hlb um are there testing labs that you can send a little tissue culture to and they can tell you do you know about that absolutely um there are various places that that do offer that um and you can even try to remediate through tissue culture but um even that process is not always perfect um, and even the testing process, depending on um, what mechanisms and instruments you're using or the people you've uh, hired to do um, are using, you can sometimes run into like false positives. Um, so even the testing can have problems, you know what I'm saying? So 
really the lack of like a lot of um uh what am i looking for is a word the lack of like sort of resources even for people who are trying to do the testing and even having a lack of um procedures and pro like best protocols essentially um is a real um weakness in our armor yeah i mean this is really making me want to start everything from seed you know what i mean i know what you mean um so and even no with, clone zone a lot of people used to say that back in the day you know mm -hmm. this is a no clone zone yeah there's definitely validity to that Well, we fired through my question, Marco. Okay. Let's see, make sure I didn't. Oh, my um, good friend of mine, um, happy to grow hungry, wants to know about tomato leaf curl. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, tomato leaf curl virus is um, really interesting because I don't. I mean, if if I'm about to learn that it's a virus of cannabis, then that's new to me. Is that why he's asking, or is he no, just no. curious? No, I got friends that also grow tomatoes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Just wanted you know to be. I mean? Hey, I I love it. I, people will send me pictures and videos sometimes. Be like, what's this? I'm like, I don't even know. But you found that on <laughs> cannabis. Great. Let's let me talk. Let me share that information. No, with people. thankfully, no. Thankfully, just <laughs> on the tomatoes. <laughs> so. Uh, tomato leaf curl. Um, is it tomato? Actually, let me just check something really quickly for myself. I think it's um tomato yellow leaf curl, right? Yeah. So um, I love this virus because it's such a cool. Well, kind of hor Actually, it's kind of horrific. But let me tell you the story. So basically. Um, it's vectored by the silverleaf whitefly, Bumisia tabasi. And I've posted about this before, but basically um, we know how we talked about how certain insects have an attraction to the color yellow. Um, oftentimes, so we interpret that to often mean that they are attracted to yellowing leaves. And oftentimes yellow is not the optimal color for a leaf. It usually means there's something wrong going on. Maybe it's a pathogen. Maybe it's it's just simply senescing, and so it's just like essentially it's dying, and so its immune response might be very different. It might be older, whatever. But that's where that kind of comes from. So there is an attraction to that because that will make for an easier and more susceptible host uh, in a lot of cases. Well, when white fly when this white fly picks up the lettuce um, or just the lettuce the the tomato leaf curl virus. When it picks it up, the virus will actually neurodegenerate the brain of the white fly and essentially damage it in such a way that it no longer has a preference between green and yellow. Now, this is really useful for the virus because that means that it's much more likely that the it's not it's not it's not like a ninety percent ten percent that the white fly will land on a yellow leaf. Or, yeah, so it will in fact be like a 50 50 split chance that the white fly will feed on an uninfected uh, plant and therefore propagate the virus in another host that is not currently colonized. You know, so that's just, that's just like, that's some like uh, last that's of us. Stuff. That's diabolic. That's, that's, not, that's not even fair. You know what I mean? That's not <laughs> no, right. it's not fair. <laughs> um, so now, but, so uh, then. So then when that fly, white fly now goes and feeds on the green leaf, now it's turning that one yellow. So is the key, mm -hmm. part of the key to get those yellow leaves off ASAP on your tomatoes? You think that's a good a question. I would say um, not necessarily. I think that might not be super useful uh, just from like a labor standpoint. Um, I wanted to bring up just since there's just this cool diagram uh, since we're on the topic. Yeah, here we go, because I made a post about it before. Um, but uh, yeah, here, I think you guys can see it, hopefully. I think the camera will focus on it. But uh, yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, it's not very good. 
Share yeah, it's not not, not as great as I thought it would be. Favorite. Yeah, let me just screen share really quickly. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, here we go. Oh, I just had it. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Oh, uh, yeah, share screen. our first screen share <laughs> sorry about that yeah hopefully this yeah. works out no well it's asking me to i guess stream yard yeah, um yeah stream yard yeah chat are you there? Yeah. anything else we need to do yep i'm here just hit share and then when the share comes up you'll get the option to share screen and then on the next one you'll have the option of which screen you're looking at i see you've got it here there we go Okay, good. Because it says stream share, so I didn't know if it would be just the tab. Um, but uh, yeah, so you guys can see the diagram. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so, he, so here we have the white fly without. It goes for the yellow. It picks up the leaf curl virus, tomato yellow leaf curl. Uh, it becomes vir viriliferous, and then, it can, then there's no choice. So it'll go either on green ones or yellow ones. It's not really worried about it but that increases the chance of the virus getting taken up. And um, uh, for those who don't know, the silverleaf whitefly also vectors a pathogen of, um, of cannabis called the legisclerosis virus. Uh, yeah, here we go. And uh, that is also a problem for cannabis and will probably become a, a greater issue uh, in general. Um, Bamesia tabasi, the silverleaf whitefly, uh, it vectors over 460 different plant viruses. It's amazingly egregious. And now we have the continuum. So I'm going to stop that screen share. Here we go. So, yeah, so amazing, right? Yeah, that's pretty wild. What kind of um, strategies do you use? Because uh, it sounds like com combating the white flies would be key, obviously. Um, what, what do you like to strategize, you know, to take care of white flies? I like to, well, because they can be a vector, uh, not having them reach your plants is really important. You don't always have that opportunity, depending on if you're growing in a field or an indoor situation. But um, mesh screens can be useful uh, a lot. I like to advocate for their use uh, when, they're, when they're sort of viable and feasible. Um, they also will help out with, like, budworm moths, which I know are also a really big problem for a lot of people growing currently. Um, as well, I've seen people utilize, actually, believe it or not, like mulches. Uh, not really a true like natural mulch, but more like uh, either like a, a, a colored mulch, which I wouldn't really advocate necessarily. But in certain research, we found that when the white fly is like passing over a canopy, uh, or, or however it's like looking for plants. It uses a lot of insect vision, like I said, is very imprecise or at least very low resolution. Um, so they're, they're really relying on different colors that they can pick up and also those colors mixed in with other colors or like a background. So like this, so like the brown ground, for example, on the green plant is like, oh, that's a plant. You know, they can tell that it is. But if it's just a sea of green, with just with a green ground and green plant and it's all green, just like a solid block of green, it really messes with their ability to really actually tell that it's a, a, it's a plant, if that makes sense, uh, from the, you know, from the sky. Um, aluminum strips have also been used, and I go over that in the Les Closes virus video, where they have been used to um, reflect UV light upwards and essentially dazzles them. It totally... Uh, um, 
it sort of turns their perception upside down and makes it very difficult for them to tell where things are coming because usually the uv light is associated with the sun or some sort of other like reflection like on water or something um so when you when you dazzle them like that then it really changes their perception and they, they and sometimes they'll be confused and disoriented and disrupted and they won't even interact with the plants so much um the study that i'm drawing this from i don't remember the title of but i do remember them saying this they said that it was as effective as imidacloprid which is a highly noxious insecticide and that's a really great term of endearment as far as i'm concerned uh, and I also love to use Bouveria bassiana uh, as a fungal parasite, and you can apply those on colonies uh, where they come up from. And you can also use a, an insect called Delphastis catalinae, which is a, the white fly beetle. It's a little small black beetle. Um, and they're also really good uh, if you have a colony of white fly as well. So those are a few techniques that you can utilize. Um, and, and some of those like color or UV related ones are um, not as common, but uh, they are kind of low tech. And I would like to see more of those utilized by various people in the future uh, because it exploits a weakness that we often don't exploit, which is the visual um, sort of uh, attraction and repulsion behavior in insects. If you don't have to fight the battle, why do it? I like that white fly beetle. That thing sounds pretty good. Is that something available? Uh, have you seen that out there commercially for you know people to purchase? Or absolutely, okay. I typically don't actually see it in nature so much as I see it um, like in, in places where people have bought it like commercially. Okay. Uh, and there's a few different resources for that, so I would I would definitely advocate for those. Yeah, there's also cool. some uh, Incarcia parasitic wasps that you can utilize too, or Retmoceris. Um, but uh, I tend to like to use Bouveria because I just feel like it's more economical. Uh, the parasitic wasps are pretty expensive, generally speaking. Yeah, I hate buying things that can fly away, you know. <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally uh, empathize with that. Yeah. So, Matthew, I kind of wanted to give the viewers, you know, after, after 10 years of doing this, 10 plus years doing this, uh, what do you what do you feel like are the most common insect issues, the things that you see on a variety of things where, you know, the, the newer person could probably study up on, uh, make sure that they they know how to combat those problems when they when they come about? Absolutely. Um, and you'll forgive me if I don't also marry this with some of the new new um, sort of interactions we've seen here that have just gotten worse. Um, so a big one. Everyone talks about spider mites. So if you've never heard of a spider mite, never had to deal with a spider mite yet, then um, just wait. Uh, it'll happen eventually. Uh, hopefully never. But spider mites are extremely common because they feed on so many other plants. So they're, they're able to kind of rapidly expand and they can feed on various plants that are around you. And then they, you know, then they transfer to your own cannabis plants. So spider mites are a big one. Um, you can counteract those with predatory mites like persimilis mites, which I'm very partial to. You can also use um, spider mite midges, which are available as well. And um, there's also a Stethoris punctillum, which is a lady beetle that feeds on spider, spider mites specifically. So you can also get that one too. Um, also, the budworm moth is very, very common lately. And, the, and typically that would be uh, the corn earworm moth, Helicoverpa zia. And those are, I've seen in the past in many crops, including cannabis, and they're just getting worse and worse. And so not only are they common, they're becoming more common. And I want to, I want to say that I'll be doing actually some research in the near future up at Ventura, um, which will be counteracting and looking to see what the, the pest populations of cannabis can be and what are the, some of the ways that we can do to sort of breed for resistance as well as uh, implementing IPM strategies. And so that will be exciting. This will be with the Rodale Institute, and I'm uh, very excited for that as well. Um, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, Western yeah. flower thrips. Oh, oh, sorry. Crime, buddy. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so far, so good, right? We'll, we'll see. 
I'm very optimistic about uh, this kind of research profile and the, the folks up there in Rodale uh, have quite the reputation. So um, I'm very, very excited to see that blossom. Um, we are too. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say uh, Western flower thrips are also super abundant and common, not only on cannabis, but many other places. So knowing them, seeing what they look like, they're very small buy a jeweler's loop or do what I do and get some watch repair glasses um, that will flip down and you can see uh, magnifications between like 15 and 30 are are good for everything. I have 20, 20 vision. So that means, I mean, so if you don't have that, maybe I, what I'm saying is not going to be biased towards your experience, but I find that I can even see russet mice with like a 25 or a 30 lens. Some people say that they can't, I don't want to like um, sort of disavow their own experience. I just don't know people's situation. But I have had that work out for me as well um, as kind of a catch-all magnification uh, range. Okay. That's good. Good. Um, what do you think about BT, man, for uh, that uh, corn earworm moth? I know some people don't like to spray. My experience is um, light. You know, if I it, it's going to be better than. Uh, doing nothing, you know, and losing a lot of crop. Um, I think BT works really well on the, on the chewing worms, but I haven't tried it for that. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a supporter of using Bacillus thuringiensis, the, the BT, and specifically um, for the moss. There's some BT for like flies as well, so it's important to get the right strain. Um, so yeah, and am, I, am I remembering the right one? Sort of embarrassing how to do it right here. Yeah, you right said now. the right one. Thuringiensis. Yeah. Is the one well, Thuringiensis is the species, but um, there's uh, Izawai, and there's Christaki, and there's Israela Zensis. And um, those are three main ones. And even those have their own, like, substrains, I suppose you could say. Um, but uh, essentially, but BT works. Um, the problem that I kind of come across with the budworms. Uh, and this is also true for the hemp, the Eurasian hemp borer, is that even if you kill it, it still is a problem. Because if the budworm or the stem borer bores into the stem or the bud and dies in it and rots, you can still have product loss. And so it's kind of like prevention is so key in, in such a in such a grand way. Because if you even if you apply, and also you have to apply often uh, quite a bit. Uh, and that can be sort of financially unfeasible for a lot of people too. But like you were kind of saying earlier, Marco, um, you know, applying sort of a natural compound, one that you can produce yourself sort of inexpensively. And um, also, you know, compounds that are going to, of course, not like interfere with the flower material itself. And that kind of thing is, is crucial. And that's, I think that moving forward, that's going to be, it already is quite necessary, you know? Um, yeah. And also there's a, there's a nucleopolyhedrosis virus that goes after uh, the budworm moth. And I'm forgetting a product name at the moment, but um, if you look up uh, like uh, uh, Helico Verpa, I have a video on my channel, but if you look up like a budworm moth virus or something or corn earworm a virus, you'll you'll find it, um, and those are very species specific to the moth. But even then, applying them it has the same sort of limitations as other biocontrols like BT, which is that you often have to reapply it. The surface of the plant is sort of a hostile environment for biologicals, um, but it's a way better than using some noxious compound that's going to poison somebody. So. You gotta pick the best lesser of the evils you know when it comes to pest prevention basically right i think we've mentioned this several times but you know for some of you that might not have heard uh you know if there's 10 things that are basically against what what to use most companies i'm speaking from colorado I, you know other states might be different uh, but they'll use the 11th on the list and they'll be compliant uh, so that's one of the mm. main reasons i felt like that lit the fire a long time ago on trying to spread education uh, with this kind of stuff is because behind the scenes especially when it was called medical marijuana uh, the facility that i was working at was actively and knowingly spraying eagle 20. Um, so 
just learning where your medicine comes from uh, is first of all the quality and then of course taking it to the next level and growing your own uh, and then like we've had a, a couple guests on the show then in my opinion if you if you have the ability then it's growing your own food and your own medicine uh, and your overall health uh, thanks to Andrew at Terra Flora you know a personal experience of uh, improving your own gut health alone by just um, understanding uh, w what nutrition can really do, especially when it's absorbed by the body, not just digested. I, I, I really want to emphasize that point as well. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's not a unique uh, story by any means, but a lot of people, including myself, became way more interested in their own gut microbiome because of soil microbiome research and phytomicrobiome research and also for me, it was with insects. So much of what makes insects so dang successful is that a long time ago, arthropods were some of the first organisms to get out of the ocean. And one of the things they would eat is basically like, you know, rotting corpses of things that have washed up on shore or, uh, you know, that kind of like flotsam and jetsam that you see all the time and like my, in kelp and microbial masses and things. And um, really early on, uh, the founders for tons of lineages um, have over time kind of taken up microbes and have established a symbiosis with them that allows them to like digest wood that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do or um, suppress the immune response of their plant host that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do or detoxify the compounds that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And so too is it for us. There are uh, you know, for those who don't know, there are like tons of viruses even in your body right now, in your gut, called bacteriophages. And they colonize bacteria in your gut and they destroy them and they propagate themselves. And that is one of the great factors that is um, uh, sort of regulating the system inside your own body. Um, and the same thing happens in the soil. There's bacteriophages in the soil. There's viruses that affect plants. There's viruses that affect fungi. And, and, and other sorts of things and insects for that matter. So it's a complex microcosm. Next level today, huh, Marco? Oh yeah, I love it. That's <laughs> it. I, love it. I think that's why people, you know, come to you because you're not only giving of your time, giving of your energy, putting together a lot of that stuff, uh, but you, you're very candid. And, you know, unfortunately some people aren't that way uh, and they kind of have to figure things out themselves sometimes or um, just spend a lot of money kind of seeing with their own eye what what works uh, so again man i just appreciate you from the industry standpoint of always if you, if you feel a certain way about something you seem like you're you know you're willing to call it out uh and for for a lot of us that are, again aren't that uh ac academically gifted on understanding plants especially at the level at ipm protocols at the level uh we appreciate that because at the end of the day, man, we're just all trying to figure this shit out together and, and trying to be, you know, as healthy as we can. So for a lot of us, cannabis is something that we need, you know, weekly, uh, some of us daily myself, you know, just to kind of, I don't know, maybe it is a crutch, you know, but but for me, like when I'm stoned, I feel like I'm way more productive. Uh, I know for some people it's the exact opposite, but cannabis doesn't affect everyone the same way. And, and for me to be able to sit here and smoke and talk with you guys and hold a conversation you know, this is, or at least when I was dreaming of all this kind of stuff, this was the dream is to kind of sit here and being able to talk to people uh, and just get the message out. So, uh, you know, I want to be able to, you know, give the viewers some ability to pick your pick your brain, Matthew. But uh, at the end of the day, man, I just wanted the industry to kind of uh, give you a thank you as well, man, because for a long, long time, I feel like you've been going out of your way uh, to share information where some of the same people in, in your shoes, uh, they don't seem like they want to share anything for free. Uh, and I guess part of that I understand as well. Uh, but when you're really just backing the industry and being a part of the industry, I feel like everybody's got to add a little bit. And uh, Matthew, you're going out of your way to add. So I just wanted to highlight that. Those are kind words and I really appreciate them. And, you know, crutch or no crutch, that same molecular thing I'm talking about is the same with your brain too, right? If everyone's brains are different, everyone's situation is different um, in our health for that matter. So... I really appreciate that you value that sort of uh, impartiality. I pride myself on that. And I pride myself on, on ha being able to have these conversations with folks like yourself too, who are um, supporting a more sustainable uh, cultivation facet. And um, it's really very necessary at the end of the day, right? 
and I'm excited to help people out. Did we already answer those questions? Do we have some more? I do have to leave maybe in about 10 minutes. Yes, if you can, same here. Yeah, yeah three three okay. hours is about all anybody wants. To <laughs> so, uh, it's about time for a pee break, so yeah. <laughs> all right. I feel um, that one. What about PM, man? Um, uh, just had a question. My remedy, I like to use, like I said, at foliars, kind of keep the plant leaves coated. Um, what do you got on PM? Is uh, trichoderma a good option, that kind of stuff? I know there's a... Um... There's a product for uh, powdery mildew. It's a parasite. It's a it's a self of fungus, I believe, if I remember right. It's Ampelomyces, and um, I don't think it's all uh, registered for cannabis in every situation. But like for people cultivating at home, if you can get access to it, um, that would be like a parasitic fungus that you could use for powdery mildew. Um, and I think it is commercially available, or I know that it is commercially available. Um, I just don't remember the product off the top of my head that I used in the past. Um, other things you can use for powdery mildew, of course, if you're not in flower, uh, people, a lot of people know that you can use like wettable sulfur. Um, although you could, although you should understand that that can have negative effects on like other biocontrols that you're using and beneficial fungi and other things like that. So it's not like it is a only, it's a generalist sort of strategy. It's not targeted. Um, a lot of people are already aware of that, I suppose. Uh, I had a post where a lot of people were, were giving examples of um, sort of natural-based immune um, responses, like you can prime the immune system with things like, uh, like chitin and other products like that. Uh, you can also um, uh, you can apply things like silicon and the and like the, the physical defense of the silicon or like or, or for calcium products as well can be sequestered into the leaf tissue and create a physical barrier that makes it harder for them to uh, infect. Um, and we even have examples of where uh, the lack of a susceptibility gene uh, creates practically immunity, robust immunity to the powdery mildew. But unfortunately, if the wrong genes are focused on or if the wrong genes mutate or whatever, then the plant actually loses access to mycorrhizae and other soil microbiome close knit interactions with the roots. So, like I said, it's a zero sum game somewhat. Uh, uh, you got to know what you're affecting, and you don't always know uh, what you're priming, what you're not priming. Uh, and people, like you say, like with products, uh, Brian, you know, people will love to sell you a product that like primes the immune system or um, gives you a biocontrol that's going to be useful for X, Y, or Z. But it may have negative effects, and they are financially incentivized to not tell you about them, assuming they're even aware of it, because they might not even be. And uh, in that case, that's just that's just how it is. Sometimes people don't always, you know, people aren't always malicious. They're just uninformed or uneducated, or the information just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well said, Chad. Do we have uh, some questions from the audience? Yeah, we, we definitely do. Uh, we got some questions here. Uh, Lancelot wanted to ask, does EM5 hurt predatory mites? And he references Ambly cucumeris. Oh, uh, and what was the question? Does EM5 hurt predatory mites? Like oh, Ambly okay. cucumeris? Let me see I if don't I can remember. pull it up here. I don't remember what EM5's uh, ingredient is with the active. Is that, okay. That's a microbe, right? I'm, I'm just uh i think it's a product is it a, is it a product oh yeah but like is it my part of the product? uh jadam em1s oh EM5s, I, see, I see all the way up i believe it's more of a plant cleaner it's a cleaner that's a form a form yeah. oh i'm seeing fermentation and enzymes I, I wouldn't worry about it too much um i don't think that that would be super negatively effective like um yeah uh, okay. I, don't, I don't think it would be a, like a hard counter. Okay. And I, and I know you're, you're all pressed for time, so I'll kind of lightning round a couple questions here for sure. you. I'll try to lightning answer. Awesome. <laughs> Do russet mites leave eggs in soil? Uh, not like typically. I mean, like, so <laughs> eggs, could, eggs could get into soil, right? Because if they're going to lay eggs, uh, russet mites usually overwinter as, as a, a special overwintering form okay okay 
So that's, that's um, I would say that it's not impossible for that to happen, but it might not be like um, ideal for the organism, if that makes sense. And if they did fall into the soil, um, you know, there's not necessarily a mechanism that will keep them from hatching unless it's like very cold or something. So if it's not very cold, if it's not an overwintering condition, then you shouldn't expect them to just like wait it out. They're not going to like, going to know, they're not like sitting in there being like, I'm just going to wait for you to put a plant in the ground and then I'm going to come out and ruin your day. You know what I mean? Right. Awesome. Um, lightning round here. Earwig, friend or foe? Uh, usually a friend. Okay. Uh, and then for Cheddar Bob, I, I just want to say, I just want to show how cool my tie-dye shirt is. A friend made this for me off of my logo. I mean, do you see oh. the resemblance? Hell that's yeah. pretty. I love it. That's pretty badass. Shout out St. Bob's Observation Booth. But for Cheddar Bob, what is a nuclear option for mealybugs? Um, well, uh, I love to talk about Bouveria, but a nuclear option... Um, I mean, like, I guess if you weren't going to worry about, like, ingesting the plants or anything like that, you could use some sort of noxious compound. But um, I, I would say you could use wettable sulfur and still have great effect because it will eat through the wax. Because what keeps them from being useful is the, is the wax, a lot of compounds. Jadam sulfur will definitely take care of them. There you go. But, but go light because I almost burned my, some young plants. So go easy on the sulfur. Yikes. Okay, yeah, there, there's one that would probably take way too much time is just thoughts on Jadam. That might be another episode for you guys to cover. Um, and then one last call comment from Dalton Cook. He said there was an ACE test where you could become certified entomologist, and that might be something worth looking at for you if you oh, were yeah. interested. Yep. But that is that that is it from the comments the chat was loving this as always um guys if you want to try to get one in in the last minute uh you could probably do that while everybody goes around and tells you where they can find each other yeah marco you this, go first? Quite, uh, yeah oh yeah just um you guys know where to find me my uh marco underscore is underscore growing on instagram and there's also uh, cannabis underscore naturally. I may or may not know him. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, next week we are kind of talking. Uh, it's kind of storytelling. Uh, hopefully, it's a, a little gift. I hope that some of you receive and appreciate. Uh, and if it is received well, I think we're going to have a other little story time on, on ways to do certain things. Uh, also check out tomorrow uh, on Future Cannabis Project. I'm with Layton uh, talking with Hayden's Hash. We're improving things on especially as everybody's trimming, taking things down. Uh, I'm going out of my way to reach out to some people that I've personally smoked their stuff or, or people that have a solid reputation uh, so that more and more people can understand it and potentially maybe make their own uh, concentrates. Oh, uh, check me out, uh, Rubber Ducky Isopods, uh, <laughs> rubberduckyisopods.com. Uh, that is how we are paying the bills. So appreciate everybody that supports us, um, especially at all the expos around the Midwest here. Awesome. And I put a lot of everybody's contact information in the comments, too, in case you guys are missing these as they fly by. Uh, but how about you, Matthew? Yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate this long-form conversational forum. Uh, I would love to come on more often, Marco, especially with regards to the BSF larvae. I don't really have a lot of places and outlets to talk about it, and I think it's a really cool thing for a lot of people. So I would love to talk about that subject and Jadam and, um, and other sorts of like sort of a natural based or a botanical based or fermentation based things that people can use because I'm a big advocate for people having cost-effective solutions that work that don't harm the uh, local environment. So I really appreciate that. You can find information about that from me on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. I also have a Patreon where people can come onto my Discord channel and ask me questions as well. As you can also come across, that's uh, patreon.com slash Xenthanol, just like youtube.com slash Xenthanol. You can also find me on Twitter at SyncAngel and on Instagram at SyncAngel is where I put the bulk of my uh, information on the Instagram posts. 
Awesome. Okay, we got we got one more one more last minute sneak in question here. Uh, any experience with X rays or ultrasound sterilizing or killing off mites? Oh, X rays would be pretty um, high energy. Sounds um, hardcore. Sounds very hardcore, but uh, I do know that a, a slightly less hardcore thing would be like UV radiation, even in the UVC spectrum. Um, that can be very damaging even to the plant tissue. Uh, but I am not a radiologist, so I might not be the best person to ask about uh, those high frequency uh, interactions. Put them in the microwave. There yes. you go. There you go. Well, one one more high speed interaction is tonight. We're coming back on Future Cannabis Project O2 uh, with another volume two of Seed Collectors. So you'll catch me and a couple other folks tonight showing showing some packs. If you want to join us at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 o'clock on the East Coast over on FCP O2. Uh, but that is the house keeping for this afternoon uh and any as, last words as always chad we really appreciate everything you do for our wednesday show man keeping everything moving and uh, uh we continue to uh, be able to reach out and have uh, these quality conversations because behind the scenes uh we don't have it issues so thank you mr chad My absolutely pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure, Excuse guys. Me. yeah thank you chad and uh thank you matthew and uh yeah, man, I think that'd be dope to hook up. And I know this this show, we talked kind of broad spectrum on just a little bit of everything. But um, definitely, man, I'd love to dig in on some Black Soldier Flies and Jadam and all that fun stuff with you. Yeah, Brian, Marco, I honestly just want to reiterate that I really appreciate you being the substrate for which we could grow this conversation and asking a lot of questions that I'm, that you guys, especially Brian, know I'm very passionate about. And that wouldn't be possible if we didn't already have this interaction and connection. So thank you again, both of you. And you, Chad, for facilitating it. Absolutely. Yes, sir. That's what awesome. it's about. Get that cool. education out there for free. Right? Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody in chat for joining and everybody who might catch us on a replay. Keep growing, keep learning. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Yeah, see you guys next week. All right. Peace, Peace guys.